Welcome to the 117th episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. So sometimes paranormal. My name is Jason Knight, host of the show, and with me, as always, is... Oscar Spector. Producer extraordinaire and podcast... Yeah, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. I I can't... Hold this in anymore. We have breaking news. What do you got? What do you got we for us? We have breaking news. I hear from the grapevine, meaning our houses, um, <laughs> that... <laughs> Don't interrupt my flow. You made me laugh. Um, that we are going to introduce a brand new facet to the SOS experience for our listeners. Now, What is that? This is just an added bonus. A bonus, if you will, on top of the regular bonuses that we provide for our patrons. But unlike that, this is for everyone. Anyone can join us. This, this, this bonus is in the form of a Twitch, Twitch uh, live stream. A Twitch live stream where you're going to see you and me, that's Jay and Oscar, over on online, live streaming, us watching a movie. What? Right? Or anything we want, really. But we're going to start with a movie. And people are going to be able to join us. And chat with us on there because, you know, that's what Twitch provides there. You can chat with us. And we're going to have a good old time watching a movie, a movie new to me, old to Jay because he's so old. It's <laughs> called Communion. Communion. Which stars uh, Christopher Walken, I believe it's from the 80s, right? Or 90s? Oh, uh, 90s. Don't hurt yourself. It was Anyways, 90s. Yes. And we're going to watch that movie. Obviously, uh, we can't show the movie because, you know, that's where we get into copyright problems. But we're going to show us talking about it, like almost like a uh, live tweeting an event. We're going to you're going to be going to see us reacting to it live. And we're going to talk about it. We're going to chat with our hopefully with our fan base. Anyone who wants to join us um, will give you a date and time. I think you have that because I already forgot, Jay. <laughs> I do. You're right. And I'm really excited about this. Oscar, you brought this idea to me, oh, maybe two episodes ago, and we've been kicking it around, figuring out yeah. what's the best way to do this. And we have settled on Twitch. The Twitch is the platform we're going to use to to stream this, this watch party, this yes. event. Mm-hmm. And that date, listeners, grab a pen and pencil, type on your Apple Watch, take a note, take a note in your phone. Uh, That live stream date is Saturday, July 11th at 10 p.m. Central, 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific. You could join Twitch at, I'm going to pull it up here, Oscar. And for our Australian listeners, it's the day before. (laughs) They're going to have to figure that one out. I just don't and, know. And the and the movie will run the other way, you know, like they're like their toilets. Boy, let's go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just lost every Australian listener we've ever had. All gone. Um, so write this down as well. Take a note. The link to join is twitch.tv forward slash Sue underscore Oscar. That's Mm -hmm. S-I-O-U-X underscore O-S-C-A-R. Twitch.tv forward slash Sue underscore Oscar. If you go to that link on Saturday, July 11th, 10 p.m. Central, 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific, you could join Oscar Spector and myself uh, uh, and watch us watch communion communion yeah and this is something we want to do on a regular basis now we know that i mean i knew this already before we picked this date but um we're going to try it anyway um this is our first time both of first us time. doing this i've first never time. done this before for movies i i i do live i have live stream game play before but not super often um anyway it's our first time so there's gonna be some kinks involved regarding um not just the way we do it but how we do it and how well we do it, and what kind of settings we'll perfect, and all that stuff. That includes the date. I know that Saturday nights, typically date night and all that, I understand lives more likely happen on weekends. But with, you know, Corona, and if you're taking it seriously, or really the state is forcing you to take it seriously, um, 
maybe you'll be home. Most likely you would be, so you would take advantage on that Saturday evening. But if it turns out that Saturday evenings are kind of too hard because, again, weekend is the time to relax and all that, why do you have to stick to a schedule? Uh, we might change it to a different day or a weekday maybe yeah. that's more beneficial for the for in general public. Um, but that's just as a general thing. We are going to change some things as we get better. Um, Absolutely. But we're going to try it out. And this is my account. My personal account. <laughs> this is, that's why it's called Sue. It's one of my old handles. I, since PS1 and all those things, uh, I've always put Sue Oscar or Sue something as to, that's the Indian or uh, Native American tribe name. I've just always liked it. It's not like I'm part of them or anything. <laughs> no, no. I'm not like a Sue or anything. I just like, I just like the name. Okay. I was. There you go. No, I hey, no explanation it. needed. So. It is what it is. But, but yeah. you, hey, listen, if you are busy and you are doing that date night, bring your loved one to the event, <laughs> bang to our voices, have a great time. You know? Right, right. Well, I don't have to know. Give us a play-by-play. No, I want to know. <laughs> oh, I you want to know. Okay. I Jay want all the nitty-gritty. Know. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Now and I'll I, tell you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. But I, I, I just wanted to say we chose communion because we're coming off of this now third episode in the extraterrestrial extravaganza podcast series yeah and and communion is all about uh, a very famous supposedly true abduction case yes um, uh, that was suffered by a man named whitley striber um striber striber however you say it uh and this is the movie listeners that scared me to death about aliens Mm-hmm. When it comes to this topic, this movie is what did it for me. Uh, Exorcist yeah. did it to half the population when it came out. You know, Communion did it for me, and right. it's it's a very it's rare. It's a rare film we found that uh, it you you can't find it. You cannot find it. That's the one thing that really sucks about our first choice, but it is a very appropriate choice, so we're sticking to it. That is the fact that uh, this movie is unavailable to stream anywhere. Anyway, yeah. you can rent it. You can't buy it. Uh, online in any in any form that we that we've been able to find, unless you pirate it, an illegal or, form, yeah, an illegal form, which um, I had to do it. That's why yep. I had to see it. So, um, arr. Arr. um, or or you buy the DVD. There's no Blu-ray as far as I know, but there's a DVD you can buy on Amazon, for example. And uh, people have uh, you know ripped it from there and put it online for people who want to pirate it. But uh, that's the only way to see it. So, but not to say that the next one will be something a little more accessible for sure. Right, um, right. Join us more appropriately for that, of course. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, listeners. We we hope you join us in this this uh, this new event we're going to try again. That's Saturday, July eleventh, ten p.m. Central, eleven Eastern, eight Pacific, and it's Twitch TV forward slash Sue underscore Oscar S I O U X underscore O S C A R. Join us at that time and, and see our reactions to this very freaky, very Christopher Walken-y movie. Cause apparently that's what I've been hearing. That's Walken very, is very walking in this film. Yeah. I'll tell you, but uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Hope to see you there. Other than that, um, mm. anything going on since the last, uh, Podcast release, Oscar? I don't know. Should I mention that thing that you know about? I think so. Yeah, okay. I think that's it. exciting news. Yeah, so it's uh, it's finally happening, that thing. <gasps> What's everyone imagining? The first thought you're thinking, that's not it. What's happening <laughs> is that uh, Lexi and I are moving in together. Oh. As the next uh, crucial step in, uh, in a heavy relationship. Yeah. It's happening. Um, we're already driving each other crazy. I don't know how we're going to make it, but, um, no, I'm kidding, of course. But, um, yeah, we have a place we have, we went, we did our IKEA thing today, meaning like new furniture, got a mattress today, uh, doing it for real about to probably ne- the next time we do our next two weeks from now, we, uh, the next show more, more than likely will be at my, our new apartment. Yeah. In your new recording studio. Right. There's a there's a, just a two bedroom and uh the the second bedroom's gonna be which is actually bigger than the actual bedroom we're gonna be using, so that's okay. <laughs> it you know, works. Yeah, that's fine. Um we're gonna use it like as an office for the both of us. We're like half and half. And I'm gonna have a nice setup, hopefully, by the time the next recording is. I might have to do it on the floor next time. I don't know what kind of furniture we'll have everything in yet, but we'll try. No. But it'll be at our new apartment. Yes. Congrats, man. I think that's great. Good for you guys. Thank you. Good for you guys. Right. Anything else? So, any, uh, any advice out there for anyone? That'd be great to know. 
contact at Chicago right. podcast.com. What is your advice for Oscar? Just don't, just don't call that number. That number's fake. <laughs> 872-529-0767. Call us, leave us a message, send us a text. I think every time you type it in, you're spelling, you know, Satan's dick or something. It's like not a real thing. <laughs> Satan's dick. Yeah, like his measurements. Oh, you know? shit. Uh, should I repeat it? 872. Why would you? 529-0767. The phones have been quiet. They've been quiet. We want some voicemails. Send us some texts. Well, this isn't like a fucking George and App write-in show, you know. This doesn't George happen anymore. <laughs> what, it was so is, random. This is some fucking, you know, shock jock. Call in. See if you can this, find you're out right. the, you're right. the song by this one note to win a t-shirt with my face on it. A few weeks? Oh, that's a great idea. To stop it. Why? <laughs> oh, speaking of shirts, I'm going to stand up because, you know, we're rolling video for Patreon. I'm wearing the shirt you got me. I thought it was fitting. Why would you put the Nazi shirt on? Oh, dude. <laughs> Wrong time. Too soon. <laughs> no, oh. it's not too soon. <laughs> it's, don't talk to strangers. See the big alien? And yeah, the I know. Kids, the I, just said that for, hands. Uh, I just said that for our audio only listeners. Just I want them to imagine oh, the worst God. shirt on it. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Edit that out. Um, uh, that's funny. <laughs> so, yeah, I got your T-shirt on that you got me. Yeah, yeah. It's really it was... an alien shirt, yes. I yeah. figured that you're scared of aliens, so I should get you an alien shirt. Absolutely. Totally. Uh, and the other shirt was kids uh, sitting around a pentagram, which is fantastic. I, I was going to wear that one. one. Yeah? Then I'm like, okay. oh, shit, I forgot I got the alien one. The next so, cult one we do, we should wear it. Yeah. Uh, for our last uh, extraterrestrial extravaganza episode, I figured I'd... Uh, I'd suit up in my alien gear here. Suit up. Suiting up. So good. You're moving out. You guys are taking on the next step, doing a lot of adulting there. Adulting? Oh, dude. So adult, So much adulting. It's, adulting. Uh, I, I've never had to pay for a gas bill and an electric bill at the same time. <laughs> now I'm doing that. Welcome to the Terror Dome. Mm-hmm. Um, other than before, that, when I moved out, sorry. Just, no, no, it's fine. When I, before, when I moved out, I just paid one fee down. No problem. It was part of a roommate thing. It wasn't even... <laughs> Barely had any responsibility, really. <laughs> so, this is definitely more. Well, good, 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 good. Um, on this front, you know, all's quiet, still on furlough. Um, mm-hmm. Getting through, you know, uh, settling my father's estate, which has been keeping me on point, on task, my mind focused uh, on on busy work, not so much on his passing. But now that that stuff is coming to an end and things are falling into place, you know, now it's starting to really hit me and wash over me, you know, uh, the true severity of, of him passing. So it's just been, you know, just a lot of mixed emotions, just a lot of stuff, just a lot of funk, you know, but yeah, I'm on point tonight. I'm excited about tonight's episode. Uh, we're doing fine. Everything's, everything's fine. It's just, it's finally starting to settle in and it's, it's, you know, fucking with me a little bit, but we're good. We're good here. Um, I'm sitting in my uh, home office, of course, looking out into the yard. The kids are in the yard uh, camping, camping out in a tent. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, they slept out there last night. I didn't think they were going to make it because the first time my daughter Talia tried to camp out there, she was with two of her little, her little friends, and they, they came running in the house at like 2 o'clock in the morning, and they said they heard uh, strange growls out there. It, it, it was a chipmunk. Yeah, I don't know what it was, but they were convinced that there was like a werewolf out there. So they all came running in. And of course, I was up. And I'm like, what the fuck you guys? But they Never made again. it. <laughs> Never again, yeah. Uh, and you're right, because that was like two years ago already. And she she didn't want any part of it. But now she's a little bit older. She watched out for her little brother out there last night. They loved it. Um, so yes. they're out there again camping. I have an extension cord running from the house. They have laptops, phones, board <laughs> games. The they most... Have- the yes. most high tech <laughs> camping out. Uncamping, yeah. Uncamping, yeah. So so they're out there doing it. It's kinda cute, kinda fun. But uh I'm ready to get this show started. We have our work cut out for us today. Yeah, have, I mean we, we say that all the time, but it feels true every time though. It really does. <laughs> right? it we're does. the we're the hard, hardest working podcast on the internet, man, I'll tell you. It's an, it feels that way, but uh, I also really understand why a lot of podcasts you know, they talk about this kind of thing. It's so hard because like, damn, it's hard. 
because they have to do all this shit too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I get, I get their plight, you know, the plight is real folks. All right. So contact the supernatural current studies podcast. Easiest way. Go to our website, Chicago ghost podcast.com from Chicago ghost podcast.com. You get to all of our social platforms, including YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, Patreon. We are on Patreon listeners. Uh, if you head over to supernatural patreon.com, <laughs> too <laughs> much whiskey. Yeah. Patreon.com forward slash supernatural occurrence studies podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash supernatural occurrence studies podcast. Pledge just $5 a month. You get access to Patreon only podcast episodes, episodes that will not appear in this public podcast feed. And matter of fact, before we jumped on the mics to record episode 117, we just got finished recording a new Patreon only episode uh, that showed some pretty intriguing poltergeist activity. Um, yeah, real life stuff too. It's all fresh, recent stuff. Real yeah. stuff, right? Really yeah. nice. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that was submitted to us. So again, head over to patreon.com forward slash supernatural current studies podcast, pledge your support, receive cool stuff. Um, 872-529-0767. Don't hurt yourself. Uh, Oscar, are you drinking over there? What do you got? I am, but I'm not uh, making mistakes like you are. It's just um, whiskey and pop. This is my second one. Simple, dimple, nothing complicated about it just something to drink also i'm trying to finish off some stuff before i move out so i don't have to carry it along with me you know <laughs> what a reason to drink i mean yeah i will cheers to that terrible i guess when you think of it that way but yes i am using alcohol as a means to lighten the load so to speak love it i love that you said pop you just lost all the listeners on the east coast and on the west coast when Why? you said I'm from pop. chicago i fucking say pop what the fuck i know it, it's pop I absolutely yeah. agree to them it's no. soda yeah, so, but I'm from Chicago. We don't care. <laughs> we lost because they did right, so, like, <laughs> um, That's the difference right there. Sorry, you got some whiskey and pop going. I have, and I, I wanted to mention this because this is this was a gift uh, from my wife that I'm drinking. It's it's whiskey. It's called mm -hmm. Jefferson's Ocean. Okay. Oh. Now, what's what's unique about this whiskey? First of all, it's very good. It's very smooth. Um, but what what they do is they cask up the whiskey. And they put the whiskey casks on ships. And then these ships travel the world. And these whiskey casks are exposed to the atmospheric conditions found on the ships in different parts of the world. Huh. So, for example, you know, the constant movement of the ocean does something to the whiskey. The sun constantly beating on the casks. So many, so many yes. uh, degrees of. <laughs> So many things involved. Yes. How do you keep uh, it up? You know? The sun beating on the cask does something to the whiskey. The salt air soaking into the cask, saturating the cask, does something to the whiskey to give it this I, very unique the quite The level, taste. the pristine level of depression that the maker felt when he built the <laughs> barrel has a different I feel like how 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 deep does it go? It's like that song. How deep does it go? Right. Um, come on. Come on. Yes. Sorry. No, so it sounds I, I, wonderful. It sounds wonderful. It, it's very good. Um, I'm just drinking it straight up. I'm almost done, uh, which is probably why I screwed up on the Patreon thing. <laughs> but uh, oh, it is good. So I wanted to mention that. Yeah, no. Sounds good. Sounds good to me, man. Should we take a break? Yeah. And is that the time? Yeah. I, I think it's the time. While we're on break for our patrons, we're going to show something fun from our recording spaces. And anyone uh, on Patreon watching the video right now, if you're astute enough, you might have noticed over my shoulder here, whoop, shoulder here, a new gentleman hanging out over there. Now, I'm going to talk about that gentleman and, and something I own of his uh, during the break uh, on, our, uh, on the normal feed. They'll get commercials. Patrons are going to find out what this guy's all about. All right. Let's do it. Listeners, welcome back to the show. Well, the lights are turned down low. Up. The ceremonial candle is lit. And the it's drinks fun. are flowing. Kind of. 
and only one of those things are true, well, <laughs> let's start this show. So if you haven't already uh, noticed, this is a part three to our extraterrestrial extravaganza podcast series. You got to go back and listen to episode 115 and 116 to get caught up on, on items we're going to talk about tonight. Cause yes. I know in my research, I refer back to some points we made in the previous two podcast episodes. You know, it's funny that what I like doing when I do, when we do multiple partners and I reference, I like, I like just shooting it in there in one sentence, like a thing, like just to remind you, Oh my God, this is connecting to that thing we talked about last time. Yeah. But you have actual connections. I don't. I just have like little references. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. Well, either way, it harkens back, you know, and, and they should catch up. Um, Definitely. Because in those episodes, we, we talked about um, the Roswell incident. We talked about a famous abduction case. Yeah. We talked about, uh, rarely talked about, for a lot of people, never before heard UFO crashes that happened right before and right after the infamous Roswell incident, the granddaddy incident. Yep. Right? There's a lot to catch up on. And this is, this is the conclusion to this three-part series. Um, on aliens and UFOs and ufology in general. Um, so in this episode, we're going to talk mainly about government programs that yes. studied and continue to study this phenomenon, as well as some key players in the UFO community, big time players in the UFO community. There's so many, we, we can't talk about it all. It is literally impossible to cover every facet of this topic in three episodes. Which is wonderful because we can always reserve it for another episode. Come, come back later if, if listeners right. want us to, right? right. Um, so we're, we're mainly going to be focusing on government programs, uh, of, you know, official and non-official government programs, and some key players in the UFO community to bring this all sort of to an end. Yes. Right, Oscar? Left. We're going to talk about some crop circles, a whole bunch of fun stuff in this one. And it's a... It's a long one. So listeners strap up and strap in cuz uh <laughs> he almost said the wrong one. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> With children, with children, sorry. Now, the first official study of UFOs by the US government began in 1948 and was called Project Sign. Due to the frighteningly high number of UFO encounters and UFO sightings in 1947 and 1948, the government found itself scrambling to try and better understand just what the hell was going on. In the previous two podcast episodes, we talked about memos and post-mortem confessions from high-ranking government officials admitting that something they didn't understand was happening. Remember, during 1947 and 1948 alone, we had the Kenneth Arnold UFO sighting near Mount Rainier in Washington. We had the Roswell UFO incident near Roswell, New Mexico, which may have included an alternate crash site where a craft and bodies were recovered. We had the Maury Island incident also in Washington, mm -hmm. where supposedly a damaged UFO rained down molten hot debris onto unsuspecting civilians. There was the Hout Corso UFO crash, the Plains of San Augustine UFO crash, the Jim Ragsdale UFO crash, and the Trinity UFO crash, and the El Vado UFO crash, which supposedly was the largest known UFO crash at the time, where the government admitted an object crashed and its remains were studied by some of the best scientists of the time. Did you know, by the way, that reminds me of a fact, of a little statistic for you, for yeah. those statisticians out there, um, back then, during this time period, uh, one in five aliens died from a car accident. <laughs> Are you serious? You thought I was I was, wait, I was waiting with bated breath, man. I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. I'm sorry. That's just the way, no, it's that's the way I deliver that joke. Sorry. Now, the fact that the Cold War had just kicked off a few years prior to these incidents in 1945, escalated the government's need to figure this stuff out. Was it the Russians or something else? Either way, the UFO problem was quickly becoming a national security problem. To try and answer the UFO question, in late January 1948, 
General Nathan Twinning established a top secret program called Project Sign, also known as Project Saucer. Remember, we talked about General Twinning in the last episode. He was the U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff and Head of Air Material Command for the United States Army Air Force and later Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the uh, the Pentagon. And he's the guy who appeared on the the cover of Time Magazine on February 8th, 1954. In my opinion, a, a highly decorated, respected man if there ever was one. If you remember from episode 116, Twinning was also the author of The Twinning Memo, which stated that flying disks being reported throughout the United States during this time period, like the examples we gave in episode 115, including the Roswell incident and the Kenneth Arnold incident, were real and not visionary or fictitious. Now, under General Twinning, Project Sign scientists sought to collect collate, evaluate, and distribute within the U.S. government all information relating to UFO sightings on the premise that UFOs might be real and of national security concern. Overall, Project Sign investigators and scientists researched about 180 cases of supposed UFO phenomena, many of which Sign researchers found puzzling. For example, a case researched by Project Sign happened on April 5th, 1948 at Hollerman Air Force Base in New Mexico, where three highly trained balloon observers were working on a secret secret project for the Air Force's Watson Laboratories. This could have likely been Project Mogul we discussed in previous episode. Initially, one of the highly trained observers saw, as he described, two large, whitish, irregularly round objects going very high up, his words. Hmm. One of the objects veered to the right and started down in a large loop and then suddenly disappeared. The second object made three vertical loops before vanishing at a tremendous speed in a large arc to the west. All three observers were certain that the objects weren't balloons and that they were faster than any known aircraft at the time. Very strange. Another UFO encounter researched by Project Sign was that of Eastern Airlines pilots Captain Clarence S. Childs and John B. Witted on July 24, 1948, while they were flying a Douglas DC-3 passenger plane in the skies above Montgomery, Montgomery, Alabama, Mm -hmm. at about 5,000 feet. It was Childs who saw the object emerging out of a distant squall line off in the distance ahead of the airplane. Closing fast just above their flying altitude, at first, the pilots thought the object was a jet by the advancing glow of its exhaust. Hmm, damn. Yes, but as the object neared, Childs and Witted were amazed to observe a large, wingless, cigar-shaped fuselage with a double-decked row of large rectangular windows or some kind of apparent openings emitting a bright glow, like burning magnesium, as they described it. Along the object's underside, the pilot saw a bluish glow, along with flaming red-orange exhaust spewing out of the rear of the object. As the strange aircraft passed off their starboard wing at an estimated speed of at least 500 miles per hour, Childs' spontaneous reaction was to jerk the DC-3 to the left to avoid hitting the object. Both pilots saw the object pass aft of them and abruptly pull up and witted sighted on the right side of the sitting on the right side of the DC three saw the object vanish after a very short, but very fast vertical ascent. Now, at the same time, this incredible event was happening. Most of the passengers on board the Eastern airlines flight were asleep. The one passenger observed a strange intense streak of light outside his window and a a report from a crew chief at Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia and a pilot flying near the Virginia, North Carolina border also confirmed the sighting. Interestingly, Project Sign received a report just a few days prior to this Eastern Airlines incident from the Hague, Netherlands, describing a similar UFO, complete with two rows of windows going down its side. Now, to this day, no one knows what these objects were. Now, 
I left two drawings in the show notes, one from Clarence Childs and one from John Witted, depicting what they saw that day. Listeners, check out the pictures in the show notes. They're, they're pretty strange. Now, overall, the consensus from Project Sign was that UFOs could be, in the worst case scenario, Russian spacecraft. And in a far-flung possibility, the UFOs could have been something else entirely, what Project Sign scientists called EHTs, or the Extraterrestrial Hypothesis. Now, the Extraterrestrial Hypothesis proposed that some unidentified flying objects were best explained as being physical spacecraft occupied by extraterrestrial life or non-human aliens or non-occupied alien probes from other planets visiting Earth, and that some of the identified, unidentified flying objects being observed around the U.S. were in fact interplanetary spacecraft. Ultimately, Project Sign's UFO investigation conclusions were sent up to high echelons within the United States Air Force, but Project Sign and their findings were ultimately scrubbed by Chief of, by Chief of Staff General Hoyt S. Vandenberg, due to lack of evidence. Mm. Yes. Right. <clears throat> that now, never, much. What's that? That happens way too much. Oh, yes, <clears throat> yes. And this comes back again later. Nevertheless, even with the disbanding of Project Sign by General Vandenberg, the U.S. Air Force decided to continue researching the UFO phenomenon. And by February 1949, Project Sign personnel and top people in the intelligence d- division were transferred and reassigned, sort of shooken up. And a new investigative body was created with a staff of people less likely to believe in the extraterrestrial element to UFO sightings, to effectively put an end to UFO reports, at least publicly. This new project was called Project Grudge. Now, the ultimate goal of Project Grudge was to put the public's mind at ease and quell any sort of Cold War hysteria. In other words, no, it's not the Russians invading our our airspace with secret weapons and secret spacecraft. Via a carefully orchestrated public relations campaign, Project Grudge concluded that UFO sightings could be attributed to only a handful of earthly or at least known explanations. UFOs could be misidentified common aerial objects like planes, weather balloons, stars, planets, meteors, solar flares, stuff like that. Hmm. According to Project Project Grudge, UFOs could be examples of mass hallucination and mass hysteria. Or they could be examples of people simply making things up to either incite fear or to gain notoriety and fame. That's it. As far as the public was concerned, Project Grudge found no evidence of UFO sightings being that of any advanced foreign weapons or foreign aircraft, and therefore UFOs did not pose any threat to national security. End of story. Now you have to keep in mind, according to Air Force Captain Edward J. Ruppelt, the director of Project Grudge, UFO cases being studied by Project Grudge were studied with the mindset that UFOs did not exist. Hmm. which is not an unbiased way to investigate UFO reports. Ruppelt said that Project Grudge operated under the, dire- under the direction that no matter what you see or hear, don't believe it. In fact, it said that the, the project's very name, Grudge, was chosen intentionally, as in project members were grudgingly investigating these obviously fake UFO claims. Okay. Now, it's also important to note that this anti-UFO stance was the Air Force's stance and not Ruppelt's. He was just following orders. In reality, Ruppelt was actually mystified by the UFO phenomenon. But the way the Air Force saw it, the mere fact that Project Grudge existed could encourage the public to believe in UFOs and contribute to Cold War hysteria. So in an attempt to disengage themselves from the UFO phenomenon, As far as the public was concerned, the United States Air Force terminated Project Grudge in December 1949, putting official government UFO investigations to bed for good. But that really wasn't the case. Internally, Project Grudge limped along for a few more years 
operating with a very small staff consisting of Captain Edward Ruppelt and Lieutenant Jerry Cummings and operating on a very limited budget. But suddenly things changed and the Air Force, the Air Force's interest in UFOs was reinvigorated on September 10th, 1951 when pilots and radar operators encountered a number of fast-moving, highly maneuverable, disc-shaped aircraft in the airspace above Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. On the morning of September 10, 1951, a radar demonstration was being conducted for a number of Army dignitaries at Fort Monmouth, when all of a sudden a radar operator picked up an unknown aircraft moving upwards of 700 miles per hour, the top speed of any known jet at the time. About 15 minutes later, two T-33 jet trainer pilots flying close to Sandy Hook, New Jersey, spotted a large silvery object flying below them. The pilots estimated the object to be 40 to 50 feet in diameter with speeds of over 700 miles an hour. A report of these sightings, presumably of the same object, was sent to Project Grudge for further investigation. Of course, word of the encounters also reached the press, which ultimately led led to high-level members of the Air Force getting involved and demanding an answer. An inquest was launched, and it was soon discovered that the operating mindset of Project Grudge was historically biased and slanted towards a no-UFO policy. The head of Air Force intelligence at the Pentagon at the time a man named Major General Charles P. Cabell, was particularly enraged about how Project Grudge operated. And Cabell not only demanded an exact answer as to what was happening with the UFO phenomenon, but he also pushed for a new, unbiased investigative body to study the UFO problem. This put an end to Project Grudge and gave rise to probably the most well-known, now declassified government study of UFO phenomenon. Project Blue Book. Now, Project Blue Book began in 1952 and was based out of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Dayton, Ohio, and Captain Edward J. Ruppelt from Project Grudge was put in charge of the project. Ultimately, it was decided that Blue Book should be terminated because after almost two decades worth of UFO research, Project Blue Book reached the following conclusions. One, No UFO reported, investigated, or evaluated by the Air Force, remember Blue Book was a division of the U.S. Air Force, has ever given any indication of threat to our national security. Two, there has been no evidence submitted to or discovered by the Air Force that sightings categorized as unidentified represent technological developments or principles beyond the range of present-day scientific knowledge. And three, there has been no evidence indicating that sightings categorized as unidentified are extraterrestrial vehicles. Now, since the overall consensus of Project Blue Book was nothing to see here, it was therefore no longer needed, and all of Blue Book's data and paperwork was transferred to the National Archives and Records Service, where a lot of that once classified documentation can be found online today. It's arguable whether or not Blue Book was really disbanded in 1969, or if it simply went deeper into the cavernous depths of the Air Force, or maybe had a name change and moved to another branch of the military, or maybe it moved to another alphabet agency, again, under a new name and funded by off-the-record budget, a black budget. And I'll talk more about this in a bit, but keep in mind, former U.S. President George H.W. Bush was at one time head of the CIA, albeit just for one year, January 1976 to January 1977, but Bush was recorded saying, quote, you don't know the half of it, end quote, when he was asked about the government's knowledge about UFOs. So maybe Blue Book moved over to the CIA. Who knows? But it's what Project Blue Book did during its years of operation between 1947 and 1969 that really captures the imagination. So much so that the History Channel recently released a a series called Project Blue Book, whose episodes are supposedly ripped straight from actual Project Blue Book case files. And if listeners are, are watching the show like I am, the strapping young Air Forceman named Captain Michael Quinn 
one of the main characters, that character is based off the real life Captain Edward James Ruppel, the old director of Project Sign and now the head of Project Blue Book at, at this time, right? Yeah, by the way, Michael Quinn, that's a very Hollywood made up character name. <clears throat> oh, is it really? I mean, it sounds it. I mean, Michael Quinn. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's the character's name. Like yeah. like Jack Cruz or something. <laughs> right. Great show. I'm binging it. But I do want to put a side note here. I don't know if you caught it, but I, I did say Blue Book's operating years were 1947 to 1969 because that's how the FBI classifies its operating years. Probably taking into account Blue Book was Pro- Project Grudge before it was Project Blue Book and Project Grudge was Project Sign before it was Project Grudge. Makes sense? So it's so all they, one thing. It's all one thing. So they that's why the name. Yeah, it's like it's like when um it's like one of those loopholes that a lot of companies go for or for copyrights, right? When you're trying to take over some names and stuff like you, you that other people won't use or free rights to use, they just change like one element of the name or they change the name of the company, and all of a sudden you don't have to pay taxes for that, or you don't have right. to, or whatever. You avoid some, something. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Like exactly. Exactly. It feels like that. So that's why I said that date range, because that's the way the FBI classifies it, because right. of its, its backlog of projects, right? Or right. its back right. Uh, trail of projects. Mm-hmm. Anyway, like I said, it's what Project Blue Book did during its official operating years that really captured imaginations, right? For example, according to Project Blue Book records, overall, between years 1947 and 1969, a total of 12,618 UFO cases were reported to Project Blue Book, of which 701 cases were ultimately deemed unidentified. In particular, the years 1952, 1957, and 1966 were extremely active with 1952 having 1,501 UFO cases, of which 303 were deemed unidentified. 1957 had 1,006 UFO cases, of which 14 were deemed unidentified. And 1966 had 1,112 UFO cases, of which 32 were deemed unidentified. Damn. Pretty amazing for a project that was disbanded due to lack of evidence of extraterrestrial activity, right? Right, because unidentified, if they're being true to what they're saying, which I don't really believe, means that, um, well, we don't know what it is, but we don't know it's not you know, aliens either, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So take, for example, the Project Blue Book case of the January 11th, 1966, Wanakee, New Jersey UFO incident, where hundreds of people, including police, Wanakee Mayor Henry T. Wolf, Councilman Warren Hagstrom, and Civil Defense Director Bentley Spencer, all witnessed a color-changing UFO hovering over the Wanakee Reservoir. The UFO was described as starting off at about the size of a volleyball. Then it changed to about three feet across and at its largest, about nine feet across. Oh, and wow. st- yes, and stunned witnesses watched as the object can't change color from white to red to green, then back to white over and over and over again. Hmm. It was very bright and completely silent as it sat there hovering over the reservoir, changing colors. When all of a sudden, According to witnesses, a beam of light shot out of the bottom of the UFO and carved out a circle in the ice-covered reservoir below. Witnesses watching this thing, for, they watched it for about 30 minutes until, without warning, the object shut off, shot off to the southeast. The very next day, so, so January 12, 1966, two more Wanake policemen, Jack Wardlaw and Sergeant David Sisko both witnessed a bright white disc floating in the sky above Wanakee uh, near Lily Mountain. This UFO was seen pulling crazy aerial maneuvers. It shot laterally left and right. It stopped midair. It shot straight up, all with absolutely no sound. Yet it appeared to be moving faster than a jet. Later in, yes, later in October 1966, Wanakee residents and police witnessed yet another UFO. What was described, this is, this is a good one, what was described as a very large basketball with its center <laughs> scooped out with a football stuck through it, moving <laughs> silently through the air towards the Wanakee Reservoir. Something tells me it's a sports sound. <laughs> right? Right. Once the UFO reached the reservoir, it moved beyond it, 
not quite into the horizon, and promptly disappeared. You know what this reminds me of, though? What? The, you know that first story, um, the first day where they saw it for 30 minutes, changed colors and stuff? Yeah. Um, and it shot down to the ice, a circle shot? Yeah. Anything that anything in there reminds you of anything? Hmm. Not I'm often. talking about the circle formation. That's the report I put from the National uh, Institute of Discovery Science about the ice circle that was found one morning by a farmer or a rancher. Oh, that's right. You're right. Good call. Seriously, saw they, they investigated it. There's no way they could have done it, and no, no, no person could have done it with, like, and there's no one around it without no. breaking the ice around it. And everything right. Else. That's right. Good throwback to the Skinwalker series. Yeah, I you're know. right. You're right. That reminds me of that. Sorry. Very strange stuff, man. Right. Now, the Wanakee, New Jersey UFO incident was deemed unidentified by Project Blue Book. Or how about another unidentified Project Blue Book case out of Texas? The August 25th, 1951 Lubbock Lights. Very famous. On this night, a team of mega brainiacs were witness to a series of lights in the sky, which to this day remain unsolved. The brain trust that witnessed this event were all from Texas Technical College. That's geology professor, Dr. W.I. Robinson, chemical engineering professor, Dr. A.G. Oberg, physics professor, Dr. George, and Dr. W.L. Ducker, head of the college's petroleum engineering department. Very credible witnesses. Yeah. On the night of August 25th, the professors were gathered at geology professors Robinson's house for a barbecue. At around 9.20 p.m., the men noticed something strange in the sky, a V formation consisting of 15 to 30 bright bluish-green lights pass overhead. About an hour later, the lights returned, same bright bluish-green color, but this time the lights were arranged in what was described as a haphazard formation. Now, it's interesting to note that the professors were not the only ones to have witnessed the strange lights that night. At around dusk in Albuquerque, New Mexico, an employee of the Atomic Energy Commission's top-secret Sandia Corporation, a nuclear research and development laboratory, a man with a Q-level security clearance along with his life, also along with his wife, also witnessed the lights. But their lights, although the same color, were attached to the wings of what was described as a huge airplane flying swiftly and silently over their home. About an hour or so after the Albuquerque sighting, a woman in Lubbock, Texas, witnessed what she described as an airplane without a body with bluish lights on its wings silently hovering past her home. Shortly thereafter, the professors in Lubbock saw their lights And actually, these mysterious lights were seen by hundreds of people all over Lubbock and the surrounding areas over the period of two weeks. The professors alone witnessed the lights 12 times within those two weeks. And I'll leave a link to actual photos of the Lubbock lights in the episode show notes. Listeners, check them out. Now, here's one more Project Blue Book case. And this one is cray cray. It's called the Flatwoods Monster. Have you heard of this, Oscar? No, no, no. Okay. Now, this incident happened on September 12th, 1952 in Flatwoods, West Virginia. Involved in the initial sighting were six boys aged 10 to 17, a mother, and a dog named Ricky. Now, this encounter, as insane as it's going to sound, made national news, prompting Project Blue Book to respond with an investigation. Now, make sure and check the show notes again. I have a picture of the original drawing of the Flatwoods monster made by a New York sketch artist based off of eyewitness descriptions. It's oh, super man. creepy. Super creepy. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what happened in, in Flatwoods, West Virginia back in 52? Well, as the story goes, it was near dusk on September 12th, 1952. Three boys, Ed and Freddie May, ages 13 and 12, and their 10-year-old friend, Tommy Heyer, were playing football in their schoolyard when they all saw a pulsing red light like a fireball streak across the sky and land on a nearby hill. The three boys immediately ran to the Mays' house and grabbed Kathleen May, Ed and Freddie's mother. 
All four ran to the location where the boys believed the red light had landed. Shortly after the four arrived on scene, other people who also saw the streaking red object showed up as well, including a 17-year-old National Guard member named Gene Lemon. The group, now made up of about 7 to 10 people and a dog, charged up the hill to see what was going on. Lemon was in lead. The atmosphere was dark and misty, and there was a red glow coming from the top of the hill. They could see it as they were running up this hill. And witnesses say that the entire area smelled metallic, like rotten eggs, so strongly that it stung their eyes and choked their throats. Now it was National Guardsman Gene Lemon who saw the creature first. It started out as what appeared to be a set of bright eyes in a tree. But what emerged from the tree sent the group running, screaming. Gene Lemon described the creature as a 10-foot-tall monster with a blood-red body and a green face that seemed to glow. Hmm. The creature was hovering just off the ground and spewing smoke and gas. Its head was spade-shaped with a distinct point at the top, and it had glowing eyes and spindly arms ending in claws, and it was making a horrible shrieking sound. The official Blue Book explanation for this incident was that the streaking fireball was a meteor, And the monster, ready for this, was in reality just a horned owl misidentified. What? Case closed. Yep. How do do you investigate that? And how do you determine that a child, even if you believe it's his imagination, that he saw a horned owl? A horned owl. That's what it was. How do you start that investigation that leads to that conclusion? Yeah. They uh, Uh, without sounding like you're just making shit up. I know. But that was that was Blue Book's uh, <clears throat> yeah. official. I'm using air quotes explanation yeah, right. for that that right. crazy crazy incident, and it's it it put Flatwoods on the map. I mean, to this day, the uh, tourism tchotchke bullshit is sold. T-shirts, statue. I mean, it's a thing, man. Like they people of Flatwoods profit they, off this. They embraced know? it. They embraced. Yeah, it. they they embraced it. Thank you. Like 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 Roswell, right? Yeah, well, definitely Roswell embraced it, or you know, either. You know, they were, although they might have been forced to, I don't think they could have avoided it. Yeah, um, yeah. But this one town and this one place, maybe not so much, but they embraced it seemingly. Yeah, you see that a lot sometimes. Yeah, yeah. but it's just a horned owl, Oscar. Move yeah. along. <laughs> Nothing to right. see here. All right, not worth all this tourism. Yeah. Right. So again, with cases coming in like the ones I just mentioned from Blue Book, and remember that's just a tiny sample of cases. I highly doubt Project Blue Book was really terminated in 1969. Sure, publicly it might have been terminated, but I'll bet my life the official search continued. Like I said, it probably changed names and was buried somewhere deep in another branch of the military or some alphabet organization. And thanks to a December 2017 New York Times article, we now know that the government's involvement in UFO studies did continue, and it did go deep underground even after its supposed dismantling in 69 with mm-hmm. the end of Project Blue Book. We remember back, that is. Yeah. Remember back in Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast episode 113, Utah's Paranormal Funland, which was actually the first episode in our Skinwalker Ranch series, we talked about the December 2017 New York Times article and how it exposed ATIP, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification, identification program a 22 million dollar black budget study of ufo phenomenon which supposedly ran from 2007 until ending in 2012 this is the program that gave us the tic tac ufo video as well as the gimbal ufo video and the go fast ufo video Mm -hmm. three videos taken by u.s navy pilots in the early 2000s showing undeniable proof of ufos and you can see today, right now, you can pause it and watch it right now on YouTube. Yep. It's everywhere. They don't even have to go to YouTube. Just go to the show notes. I have the links there. Nice. They're incredible. They really are incredible. And I could guarantee you this. If projects like Blue Book and like ATIP are producing results, they're not going anywhere. They're not going to be dismantled permanently. ATIP will likely follow suit, like all the other UFO programs. And now that it's been exposed, it'll probably have its name changed and get buried deeper into bureaucracy and even further away from the public's eyes. Or refocus into something else to hide what it's really... Right, but its studies will continue. 
So those are the four popular known government UFO analysis programs that most people in the UFO scene are aware of. Mm-hmm. Sign, Grudge, Blue Book, and most recently, ATIP. However, there's another program you may have heard about if you're really into this stuff. And this one seems to be more clandestine than the rest. A program that's really shrouded in mystery. And that's the supposed U.S. President Harry Truman-backed UFO research program called Majestic 12, or just MJ-12, which operated under the code name Project Aquarius. Now, it's important to note, excuse me. Listeners, I'm sorry. Oh. It's important to note that President Truman himself had an encounter with UFOs as part of a huge UFO incident in Washington, D.C. in 1952, which I'll talk about here in a bit. But it's also important to note that according to all CIA and FBI records I've researched for this show, unlike Project Sign, Grudge, Blue Book, and ATIP, MJ-12 is fictitious. It's not real. Determining whether or not MJ-12 was real is a little confusing. On one hand, we have declassified documents saying that it never existed, which I said. But there is a top secret letter that exists from President Truman himself, dated September 24th, 1947, addressed to Secretary of Defense James Forrestrall, which gives Forrestrall, in conjunction with Dr. Vannevar Bush, no relation to those Bushes, and the CIA permission to move forward with a project called Majestic 12. And the document is signed by Harry Truman. I'll put a link to this letter in the show notes so you can read it for yourself. What do you think, real or fake? Now, this letter from President Truman, which articles, again, on CIA.gov and FBI.gov claim is fake, in and of itself, was supposedly a direct response to the Roswell UFO incident of 1947. And according to documents, the goal of MJ-12 was to investigate the circumstances surrounding the Roswell incident and to maintain vigilance against further alien incursions. Wow. Names that are associated with the MJ-12 program are pretty big and include Rear Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter, first director of the CIA, Dr. Vannevar Bush, who headed the wartime Office of Scientific Research and Development, and James Forrestal, Secretary of Defense. But again, the government vehemently denies that this program ever existed. Now, among the many, many tantalizing bits of information contained within MJ-12 records, supposed MJ-12 records, Scientific, specifically an ultra-top-secret document dated January 1st, 1989, entitled Assessment of the Situation, Statement of Position on Unidentified Flying Objects, and prepared by the Defense Intelligence Agency, the DIA, sub-office Majestic 12, addressed Damn. to the White House, there are bullet points within this ultra-top-secret document outlining the overall UFO situation up to that point in January 1989 when the document was apparently created. Now, those bullet points are as follows. Bullet one, advanced beings of non-human nature are continuously being detected along with their flying disc craft in the controlled airspace of the U.S. since July 7th, 1949, the Roswell incident. Hmm. Bullet two, the remains of seven flying craft and the bodies of 27 deceased non-human beings have been recovered as of this briefing date and are at present being studied by Majestic 12 scientists. Now, here's a side note. Later in this document, it's mentioned that these aliens, these bodies, are from the Zeta Reticuli star system. Wow. Flashback to, to Oscar's Barney and Betty Hill abduction story from last episode, right? Yeah. Okay, bullet three. Three of the recovered craft are nearly intact, and one machine has maintained some of its power since retrieval in 1948. And bullet four. Since 1957, no additional alien craft have been available for study. The assessment is that that these beings have adopted or perfected the machines to the conditions of our world so as to avoid any further such revealing crashes. 
Now, here's another side note. I'm wondering if this bullet is referring to the theory we talked about in this podcast series about the U.S.'s advanced radar systems being used as unintended weapons to bring the craft down. It's mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. Now, this, this, this classified top secret, uh, ultra top secret uh, document, that was the actual labeling on the document, ultra top secret. The document goes on to describe what really happened at Roswell which according to this briefing, this document, the Roswell incident was absolutely real and alien bodies and aircraft were recovered. The document also states that the Aztec UFO crash on or around March 25th, 1948, the one we talked about in episode 115, again, was in fact real. This is the crash that had the official plaque stating what happened that this, this, Thing came down and crashed and the top scientists were investigating it. According to MJ-12 documents, absolutely real. It's just fascinating. Uh, you know, you mentioned the, yeah. uh, the DIA before. If I remember correctly, because I mentioned them before, I think during, again, the Skinwalker uh, two-part episode we did, um, aren't they, isn't that like a, like a, a well, DIA is for what again? Defense, no. What Defense Intelligence Agency. Intelligence Agency. Isn't that just uh, completely under the wing of the defense of the the, um, the Secretary of Defense? The DOD, the, the Department of Defense. The, no, not the Department of Defense. The Secretary of Defense. Only one person. Like it's personally like they report only to him or her. I don't know. Isn't that, isn't that the one? I, I think I mentioned that. I, I'm trying to remember my. I'm trying to recall, but it's hard because those notes are gone. But uh, I'm. I believe it was created by Truman. I, hmm. I remember correctly when I mentioned it back then that it was, but it was meant for, it was meant for, um, oh no, maybe not true. Maybe it was McNamara that did it. Anyway, that it was created uh, under the, where the, um, for very similar counterintelligence, I think, but that it was used to only report to the Secretary of Defense. If I remember correctly, I believe that's the DIA, which makes sense okay. because of what you were talking about with the Secretary of Defense at the time. Yeah, as well as the president. So it makes sense that they would go use the DIA for their info. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quite possibly. We'd have to go I'm, back. I'll, and I listen. hope I'm right. I hope I'm right. <laughs> We'd have to go back and listen. Yeah. Now we could we could do an episode or two just on this MJ12 ultra top secret document alone, mm-hmm. but I want to move on and talk a little bit about someone named Dr. Stephen Greer because Greer is doing some really interesting things in the field of ufology. Namely, something called CE5, or close encounter of the fifth kind, a method used to make personal contact with aliens and alien craft. This research that's being conducted today outside of the authority and control of the government, and it appears to be working. Now, before we talk about Stephen Greer, I want to explain the close encounter system of measurement. Because Stephen Greer's CE5 research is an extension of this famous measurement system. Mm -hmm. So the close encounter system of classifying UFO experiences was invented by another famous man in the academic, scientific, and UFO research communities, a man named Dr. J. Allen Hynek, a Chicago native. Holla! Mm -hmm. Never again. Now, before becoming a highly acclaimed UFO researcher, Hynek was a, was a, had a doctorate in astronomy and was a professor at Ohio State, where he was also the director at the university's Macmillan Observatory. Hynek worked at the Harvard Observatory at Harvard University, where his assignment was to direct the, tra- the tracking of American space satellites. And he worked as a scientist at the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory during World War II, where he helped to develop the United States Navy's radio proximity fuse, huh. which in essence was a fuse that was designed to screw into the nose of a bombshell, which would allow a timed explosion at any desired distance from a target, a really big deal during the war. Heineck was also a consultant for Steven Spielberg's 1977 film, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He even had a cameo in the movie. Heineck appears at the end of the film. Really? Yes. <laughs> when, when the huge alien mothership comes down and reveals itself and its occupants in front of stunned scientists. And if you're interested, I'll leave a link in the show notes to a photo of Heineck's cameo. 
Spoiler if you're a, yes, if you're a fan of Close Encounters of the Third Kind like I am, it's pretty fun to see. So check it out. So this guy, Heinick, he was no dummy. Quite the opposite. And Heinick, too, just like most of the topics we covered in this extraterrestrial extravaganza podcast series, can have an episode or two dedicated just to him and his research. Unfortunately, we just don't have the time to get into everything Heinick has done. But what I want you to know is this. J. Allen Heinick was a principal scientific advisor for projects Sign, Grudge, and Blue Book. Oh. Yes. And again, if you're following the Project Blue Book television series like I am, J. Allen Heinick is the main character who's played by Aidan Gillian, the guy who played Peter Baelish in Game of Thrones. No, Littlefinger. Littlefinger, yes. Anyway, based off of Heinick's decades worth of UFO UFO research, he developed a classification system to rate people's experiences with UFOs. It's called the Close Encounter System and basically rates a person's level of intimate contact with UFOs and aliens on a scale from one to three. Now, it's important to note that Heinick's scale, the original scale, has three levels of contact, but other levels have been added over the years by other UFO researchers. And it's really a mixed bag of responses as to whether or not serious ufologists regard these additions as valid. Okay. So Heinick's close encounter system is as follows. There's close encounter level one or CE one. This is a UFO sighting at close range, less than 500 feet with a considerable amount of detail, but without tangible evidence. So it's within 500 feet. A witness discerns much detail about the object, but there's no physical evidence of the object. That's CE1, close encounter level one. There's close encounter level two or CE2. It's a UFO sighting at close distance, less than 500 feet with a considerable amount of detail, but with tangible physical evidence like radar hits, electro interference, photos, damage to an area, burn marks, crop circles, animal Uh, disturbances, things like this. Okay. Got it. Then there's close encounter level three or CE3, which combines CEs one and two. So a short distance sighting, considerable amount of detail with physical proof, but CE3 adds interaction with or sighting of actual aliens or what Heineck refers to as UFO knots kind of like that sort of astronauts ufo knots yeah yeah now heinick also had a classification system for objects sighted more than 500 feet away if the objects were seen during the daytime and at a distance over 500 feet he called them daylight discs if they were seen during the nighttime at over 500 feet away he called them nocturnal lights hmm. and if the objects were spotted on radar they were simply called radar visual Overall, objects more than 500 feet away were harder to discern as authentic UFO encounters from simple atmospheric conditions and anomalies like sun flares or temperature inversions. Now, popular additions to high Nick scale are close encounters of the fourth and fifth kind, CE4s and CE5s. Close encounters of the fourth kind is an event in which a human is abducted by a UFO and or wow. its occupants. Got think it. Right. Think Betty and Barney Hill from the last episode you covered. Right. CE4 also includes the transformation of a person's perceived sense of reality. They don't necessarily have to be abducted to fall into CE4 category. They merely have to have their sense of reality altered as a result of coming into contact with the UFO or its occupants. Think of the 2009 movie starring Mila Jovovich called The Fourth Kind or something we've talked about in this show before called the Oz effect, where one person could be in the throes of a UFO experience, but a person standing next to them is completely unaware of what's happening. Sense of reality adjusted, altered, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's the close encounter of the fifth kind, CE5s. This one is very interesting, and it leads us right into Stephen Greer. As Greer came up with this level, and he named it, through his work with a nonprofit organization he founded called the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or CSETI. Now, according to Greer, 
who, before he became a world-renowned ufologist, was a traumatologist, according to Greer, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind is direct, human-initiated, cooperative, bilateral communication with extraterrestrial intelligence through consciousness. That's the key. Oh. Yes. Now, Greer argues, and in my opinion, is absolutely correct, that we as humans cannot initiate contact with extraterrestrials based on how we initiate contact with other humans because ETs aren't human. We can't go up to an ET and say, sup, dog, what you smoking on? What's in your mouth? ETs are beyond that. They've evolved beyond ordinary means of communication. No, we have to develop a way to communicate with them that's beyond face-to-face hellos or a handshake. Hell, even behind a radio signal beamed into space. Think about it. Right now, we're beaming signals into deep space in hopes that one day, God knows when, something will pick up those signals interpret them, then send something back to us, letting us know that, God damn it, something's out there. But how big is the universe? The radio signals we're beaming out into the cosmos right now travel at the speed of light, which is a little less than 300,000 kilometers per second, or approximately 671,080,888 miles per hour. At that speed, a radio signal could go around the Earth at the equator more than seven times in a second. It's fucking fast. But our cosmos is infinite. It could take thousands, if not millions of years, for our signals to even reach something intelligent. Right. No, according to Greer, we have to develop a way to communicate on the alien's level through a method that's faster than the speed of sound, faster than the speed of light even. And that method, a method each and every one of our listeners are capable of, that you and I are capable of, Oscar. The biggest secret in the world, according to Greer, is communication with ETs through meditation and consciousness. Ah. Now, instead of trying to communicate with the speed of light or sound, we're communicating with the speed of thought. Consciousness, Greer argues, along with some of the most highly regarded scientists and philosophers in the world, is the single thing that binds everything and everyone, whether we're here on Earth or millions of miles away on another planet. From humans, animals, plant life, and ETs, consciousness through meditation is the, the only way, the true way to interact with the universe and be part of it. That's and a I'm, very mystical answer. It really is. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, Greer and his people, they're doing it. C. Seti claims to have over 3,000 confirmed reports of UFO sightings and over 4,000 proofs of what Greer describes as landing traces, actual proof that these things are real. And through meditation, Greer and his team could actually summon UFOs. Hmm. Now, I recently watched a 2020 documentary called Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. Contact has begun. Highly recommended. I don't want to make this a commercial for the documentary, but in it, Stephen Greer speaks in great detail about his method for communicating with and summoning UFOs and extraterrestrials. He has some of the highest level whistleblowers included in the documentary, people that would blow your mind, admitting that UFOs are real, the government has been studying them, and talking about experiences they've had themselves or have intimate knowledge about. And probably the most impactful thing for me with this documentary, Greer has proof, video proof, of his UFO and alien contact through meditation claims. Some of the footage is truly unbelievable. And I'm going to tell you, after I finished the documentary, I wanted to go right outside at night, sit on my deck out there, and for the first time in my life, try to truly meditate to see if I could make contact. That's how affected I was by this documentary. And I hate this shit. Scares the hell out of me. <laughs> but I honestly believe Greer and C. Seti are onto something, something huge. And if I do decide to try and make contact through meditation, I'll let you guys know what happened. Now, I know it's a little late since I last mentioned it, but I do want to mention President Truman's UFO experience, as it probably had a lot to do with his insistence on the Majestic 12 program. I know this is a little off base. I wanted to bring it back and make sure and talk about it. It all stems, Truman's interest and and his insistence on Majestic 12, 
all stems from a July 1952 incident where up to a dozen UFOs were spotted flying over Washington, D.C., including over the White House and the Capitol building. Believe it or not. Now, of course, Truman was president from 1945 to 1953. So this happened during his presidency. He could have been at the White House when these things were flying over. The UFOs over Washington were witnessed by radar operators at multiple radar stations, whose job it is to keep an eye, a constant eye on the skies over D.C. The UFOs were also witnessed by professional pilots and many other highly credible witnesses, not to mention literally countless citizens. At multiple times, jets were scrambled to try and intercept the UFOs, but the jets were overtaken and couldn't get close to them. It said that at certain points during the sightings, the UFOs traveled with speeds upwards of 7,000 miles an hour. These encounters over Washington made huge news, world news. Everyone was talking about them. And the, ex- the official explanation given mm. was weather anomalies. Temperature. Not, what about owls? Temperature inversion, to be Let's exact. Go Let's yeah. go back to owls. Yes. Unbelievable. And since we're talking about presidents and UFOs, President Jimmy Carter claimed to see a color-changing UFO in Georgia in 1969. President Ronald Reagan claims that in 1974, a bright white UFO chased an airplane he was flying in over Bakersfield, California. Ronald was Reagan saying, was it saying say no to drugs. <laughs> Reagan said the UFO chased his plane for a few minutes before shooting off straight up into the heavens. Reagan's words: straight up into the heavens. And it was Ronald Reagan in a recorded speech that went on record and said, and and I quote here, when you stop to think that we're all God's children, wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but say to Gorbachev, just think how easy his task in mind might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species, from another planet outside the universe, end quote. Reagan went on in the same speech. Quote, perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bond. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world, end quote. He's describing the, the premise of uh, Starship Troopers. Yeah. I mean, what a curious thing for a U.S. president to say. And this is on record. There's video of this. And it's widely reported that one night in 1973, President Richard Nixon, good old Tricky Dicky, without security or Secret Service escort, picked up his good friend and actor, Jackie Gleason, from the old you, – you heard this one, right? No. From the old – okay, so yeah, without escort, without Secret Service, President, um, <laughs> President Richard Nixon drove yeah. to Jackie Gleason's home in Florida and took Gleason – of course, Gleason's from the Honeymooners, right? And drove Gleason to Homestead Air Force Base in Homestead, Florida, way down south, just above the Keys, where he showed Gleason the embalmed bodies of four aliens. Jackie Gleason said the aliens were about two feet tall with small, bald heads and unusually large ears. Hmm. And it's important to note this Nixon Gleason story has never been proven to be untrue. That's now, I know I've covered a lot, and I'm coming to the end here because I want to get Oscar's research in. But for now, I say, let's just keep our eyes off our phones and instead turn them to the sky. We won't see anything if we're not looking. Right? Maybe. Maybe, maybe not. So what do you got for us, Oscar? What do I got for you as uh, two... Let's say that too. Two different things for you guys. Two different uh, pieces. Um, I would say totally unrelated. They are really quite unrelated to each other. But uh, the one thing that connects them is, of course, our extravaganza theme here of alien slash extraterrestrial activity. So let's just get into it. We'll get into probably the one that everyone knows about. We'll start with the most popular one. What's that? Crop circles. (gasps) You've heard of crop circles. We've all heard of them. They look lovely, don't they? They're just eye pleasing, awesomely patterns, geometrically pleasing, right? Yes, and, exactly. And, then, and you, then, know, you know, Oscar, it's very funny that you start decided to start with um, crop circles because one of the physical proofs of evidence that Stephen Greer and C. Seti uh, have yeah. uh, through their CE5 contact 
are crop circles. Oh, wow. Crop circles just suddenly appear when they summon these UFOs. So what a perfect segue. Yeah, I remember. I, I, you know what? I do remember you mentioning that, like briefly, really quick in your research. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, it's a perfect, maybe like a time delay segue here. So, what, like, you know, people are wondering, maybe out there, what exactly is a crop circle? A crop circle are patterns that appear in fields, typically farmland fields, where the crops are stalks in nature. And now they kind of have to be in order for, you know, the designs to happen. Qualifications for a legit crop circle are that the stalks are bent and rarely broken, often still growing after being pressed down. They sometimes still grow. It's funny. Nature. Uh, picture a huge machine pressing down on a field, sliding it and repressing different areas like sand art to create a pattern. Another qualification for a crop circle is that the patterns are as artistic as they are geometrically pleasing in measurements and to the eye, which I just mentioned. Yeah. Designs vary from simple circles, you know, just simple circles, to elaborate one-of-a-kind patterns. A common trait that all crop circles share is that they're seasonal. From April to September is high crop circle season. And it's obvious why. That's when crops grow. That's okay. when farmland's being worked on. It's hard to do a crop circle in the fucking winter. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so April to September, it's crop circle season. Rarely, if ever, as I couldn't find one, uh, are they done anywhere, uh, any other times, you know, that it, that, that is in spring or summer, you know. Another qualification for this phenomena is that they're elusive in nature. Whether it's man-made or not, the patterns appear almost always overnight with no witnesses. Lastly, and this is not a qualification of a crop circle, but still worth mentioning, are that glowing blue or green lights emanating from the field as a crop circle is discovered. That can happen sometimes. Whether the lights from the circle is unclear, whether the lights is from the circle, like whether the lights form, sorry, not from, form the circle is unclear. And finding solid reporting on this is sketchy but it has been said in the past multiple times, so it must be said here. It's not exactly a qualification. It doesn't happen even most of the time, but sometimes it did. I think I've um, seen video of that before. Really? I, I don't know if it was authentic, but yes, you're right. right. You're right. Mm, that's interesting. I haven't seen video. I didn't see many videos, but uh, more of a reader kind of guy when it comes to this research stuff. Um, now, the 20th century gave birth to the immense popularity of crop circles, particularly in the 1980s to the 90s. Oh, the, um, sorry, lost my voice there. <laughs> I know, I've, I've been having that problem tonight too. The alcohol. Although earlier crop circle appearances began in the 60s, the area of the world most affected by these strange patterns was the U.S. and Europe. More so, a lot more so, in England. Mm. In fact, the crop circle phenomena hit popularity in an English farm. That's where it started. Well, I mean, you know, when it gained popularity. In 1980, a farmer in Wiltshire County, England, woke up one morning to discover three circles, each about 60 feet or 18 meters across. Remember, that's Europe. Um, in his old crops. I could almost do an episode alone on Wiltshire County for <laughs> being a crop circle Grand Central Station. But it's true. There was, it wasn't the first. There's so many. Mm. Wiltshire County were not tourists to the phenomena at all. Farmers all over the area experienced strange mornings that began as early as 1962. You know, wake up, see out there, and look at the fucking crop circle. One of my favorites, actually, is an optical illusion formation near Sabernick, Sabernick, I think, forest in that county, in that same county, where the pattern consists of 180 separate standing and flattened crops and runs roughly 200 feet across or 60 meters. Wow. Um, Australia, we're going to get a little farther, is home to an early crop circle sighting that will become semi-important further on in the research here. In 1966, in Tully, Queensland, Australia, a farmer saw a saucer-shaped craft rise 40 feet and fly away from a swamp. Investigating the area, the farmer saw a circular saw a circular area 32 feet long by 25 feet wide, Jeez. where the grass was flattened in clockwise curves to the water level within the circle. It was reported ultimately as violent downdrafts on the ground. And that's it. What? Yeah, I know. It's like, but it's not, I mean, it's, it's still a better reason than you're a fucking owl. Yeah. 
But, you know, <laughs> either way, that's what they said. Anyway, that 1980 formation in Wiltshire County brought in the bulk of the media helicopters, ufologists, and tourists. This incident cranked crop circle sightings up to 11, hitting U.S. farmlands as well. By 1990, there were over 500 patterns all over Europe and the U.S. Also other places I would mention like Japan and, and Canada, just not as much. Okay. Which easily, this doubled the next year. 1991, over 1,000. Double. Wow. Mm-hmm. In the south of England, most circles were concentrated pri- primarily in the counties of Hampshire and Wiltshire. Many of them have been found near Avebury, Avebury, maybe, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, and Stonehenge, two <gasps> mystical sites containing large monuments. Whoa. A lot of them did, a lot. Crop circles became so popular that farmers would charge tourists to look at them. <laughs> Helicopter tours and many t-shirts were sold, and while many farmers despised damages to their farms, locals loved the influx of strangers. Generally, people from all sides enthusiastically welcomed the opportunity for business and seeing all the crop circle groupies, ufologists, and people seeking spiritual you know, experiences. They loved it overall, mind you. A term was even created to acknowledge people into, into crop circles. It's called seriology. It's defined as the following. Crop circle enthusiasts that believe that crop circles are the work of either extraterrestrials or plasma vortices. Ceres, in the name seriology, comes from Roman from the Roman goddess of agriculture. So it's appropriate. <laughs> It is thought that the reason crop circles appear on farmland areas and and the like is because of how ideal it is for even ground and the aerial point of view they provide. It is that much more noticeable, that much more pleasing to the eye. It is the reason why most of the crop circles are in spitting distances from main roads and why many are nearby other densely populated locations which kind of interesting in a weird yeah, way. It really is. Activity stays away from densely populated locations, but this one does. This one likes it. Huh. So how are these crop circles made, you might wonder? To really understand the, the how of these patterns is to then answer the who and the potential whys. Since that particular series of forked branches lead to theories, I'll save it a little bit longer. Now that you know what a crop circle is, and know how popular it became within its very lifetime, we can move on to some history. That's right. The 20th century may have given crop circles popularity, but it didn't begin in the 1960s. In 1932, archaeologist E.C. Kerwin observed four dark rings in a field at at Stockton Down near Chichester, England. Again, that's south again, I believe. Examining one of these circles, he described it as, quote, a circle in which the barley was lodged or beaten down while the interior area was very slightly mounted up, unquote. But that's still 20th century talk. Let's fuck that shit. Let's go further back, and in doing so, we'll give you a glimpse as to the possible explanation for this phenomenon. Nature is the title, nature, nature, is the title of a British weekly scientific journal founded in London in 1869 that still operates today. Wow. So, in 1880, an amateur scientist named John Rand Capron, or Capron? Capron, probably, sent a letter to Nature about a mysterious occurrence on his fir plantation. That's F-I-R. Here's the letter in full, and it's not too long. <sighs> Let me see if I can read this the way he did it. I'm not going to sound all pompous, but here we go. <clears throat> Quote, the storms about this part of Surrey have been lately, lo- lately local and violent, and the effects produced in some instances curious. Visiting a neighbor's farm on Wednesday evening, 21st, we found a field of standing wheat considerably knocked down, not as an entirety, but in patches, forming, as viewed from a distance, circular spots. Wow. Examined more closely, these are all presented much the same character vis-a-vis a few standing stalks at, as a center. Some pros, prostrate, prostrate? There you go. Prostrate, yeah. Thank you. Stalks with their heads arranged pretty evenly in a direction forming a circle round the center. And outside, these a circular wall of stalks which had not suffered. Such a weird way of writing. It still goes on, though. 
I sent a sketch made on the spot, giving an idea of the most perfect of these patches. The soil is a sandy loam upon, a, upon the green sand, and the crop is vigorous with strong stems. And I could not trace locally any circumstances accounting for the peculiar forms of the patches in the field, nor indicating whether it was wind or rain, or both combined, which had caused them, beyond the general evidence everywhere of heavy rainfall. They were suggestive to me of some cyclonic wind action and may perhaps, yeah, may perhaps have been noticed elsewhere by some of your readers. End quote. Wow. Pretty odd, right? You're describing pretty much a crop circle there. Absolutely. But from 1880? Uh, let me read that again. 1880. 18, yes, yeah, right. so back as far back as 1880, they were reporting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't this know letter which came into public notice for seriologists when Nature reprinted it in the year 2000, gives a glimpse as to one of the theories for the creation of crop circles. But let's move on, though. Let's go all the way back to the 17th century. What? In 16, 1678, to be exact. That's how 17th century we're going. <laughs> Sorry, I wrote this weird. No, I love it. We've said before that the further back you go, the chances of almost everyone having a deep religious belief is certain. Personifications of divine or sinful beings would show up in song, stories, and writings. Here's an example of one that relates to crop circles. There was a quattro pamphlet in circulation in Hertfordshire, England in 1678. Quattro is Latin for the number four or the fourth of something. In this case, a quattro pamphlet is a piece of paper folded twice to make four pages. That's why the name. The title of this quattro pamphlet was called the Mowing Devil. In the pamphlet, it tells the story of a farmer whose field of oats was destroyed by the devil after the farmer rejected the price asked by a mower and said that the devil could mow it instead. The front, pages carried, the front page of this little booklet carries a drawing of the devil or a devil, maybe not the devil, I'm not sure, mowing the crop in a circle formation uh. with, with a scythe. Wow. And it's even. It's all even, obviously. There's a fire, though, emanating from the cut areas. Not many seriologists believe this to be the first record of crop circles, but there are some that do. The glaring differences between modern crop circles and this old one is the fire mainly and without an intricate design than just a circle. But that's, you know, we've seen just circles before, too. This 1678 pamphlet is worth mentioning, even though despite the fire and some of the glaring differences. And also, you know, we don't take them as seriously as we do nowadays. <laughs> People from back then. Yeah. Um, okay. Firstly, early crop circle discoveries in the 20th century were just circles. But as you can see from the lowly farmer and all that. Um, but, you know, more than all that, I can easily imagine a farmer waking up one morning to find this crop circle like the farmers that found crop circles hundreds of years later in the 20th century and telling people about it. And that that story becomes a cautionary tale that becomes wrapped up in the beliefs of the people living there. I mean, that kind of thing happens all the time. Not to say that the devil actually did it, but you can see how a story like this can, you know, shoot off in a certain direction. Sure. So, you know, before you start, you know, discrediting people from 1678, which, you know, I wouldn't trust them with science, but I would trust them with, <laughs> with what they saw, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or antiseptics, right? Um, or anything like that. Anyway, they're dead. They don't know what. All right, now let's get to some theorizing. Surprisingly, there are more than just the two possible reasons as to who or why these crop, crop circles are made. The two that most people assume are either you know man-made or extraterrestrial. That's what I thought too. Let's glance at yeah. the possible reasons. I have uh, how many do I have? Up to F. I don't know why I lettered them, but I did. Uh, firstly. The devils, right, or demons might have a hand in it, at least according to that pamphlet. It is as likely as the reason for the crop circles as seriously as we take people from the 17th century, century seriously about this phenomenon, which is not very much. But it must be said, especially when you think of the idea of a portal to hell and an acknowledgement of something evil in the area, maybe a cult work or simply mischievous behavior by a bored imp. All that, you know, slight possibilities. Second one. A small theory is that small airplanes and helicopters might produce crop circles, that their downdrafts would push, would push crops down into patterns. That <laughs> sounds silly. And attempts to recreate this were, were done during, during the, I believe, 70s, and they could never accomplish it. 
because okay. impossible is a dumb reason, but people thought, and it must be said. Okay, no, good, good. Yeah, yeah. Another reason might be something with equal parts scientific as well as spiritual support. Earth energy. The mo- that Mother Gaia herself produces these markings as a marking, as a as a way to signify great pain, such as the pain endured during the Great Wars. Wow. Scientifically, though, some people believe that the Earth creates its own energy, creating crop circles. Some circles have given off a magnetic field, sometimes people able to feel it, tingling sensations mostly, though. Wow. Some people... Um, that you know, some people that the energy comes. From, some people believe that the energy comes from the soil, either a byproduct of old bomb activity like World War II, or something natural like fungus that attacks the crop. <laughs> you know, and attacks the crop in those formations. All of these are slight possibilities. Interesting though, but um, but yeah, that magnetic field thing. I kept it away from the qualifications because it's even rarer, even more rare than the glowing lights. So oh, I didn't, okay. I didn't really put it in there. I kind of just stapled it in there. Okay. Here's the next one. <clears throat> Keeping the theme of natural causes, the winds themselves might be a reason crop circles exist. Small currents of air swirling about are called vortices, which are not unlike dust devils. There's a scientist over at, at the Tornado and Storm Research Organization, or TORO, named Dr. Terence Meaden. He and others thought that these swirling winds, especially in the hilly parts of southern England, where most of the crop circles were done, would surge greatly, making the phenomena. Dr. Meaden had a theory to explain the glowing lights, actually, that are sometimes seen with the crop circles. It's called plasma vortex theory. He theorized that when dust particles get caught up in the spinning charged air, they can appear to glow, therefore explain the phenomena. Wow. You know, but not proven, though. Not very much proven. He's kind of the only one that's spearheading that particular theory. But he's a you know scientist, so you know whatever. Uh, let's get to the next one. We have two more, and these two are the doozies, of course. A very good explanation for most of the crop circles, especially in recent decades, is that they're man-made. It doesn't require heavy machinery or any kind of technological engineering either. In two thousand two, a movie called Signs by M. Night Shyamalan Love begins with yeah, I know you do. Begins with a farmer discovering a crop circle on his land. In it. A character tells a farmer that crop circles could be made with a group of people with boards and a rope and that it could be done overnight before, you know, being noticed in the morning. You can see videos online of people doing it, though it does look like it would take many hours to accomplish some of the more elaborate patterns, not to mention great coordination. Think about that. You need great coordination. Remember, these designs are flawless in the flattening of the crops and edging. What broke the potential secret of crop circles were two people. These two people, Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley. Chorley, let's go with that. In 1991, they made headlines by showing a seriologist on tape the method to make crop circles. They did it with boards and a rope. Wow. They, yep. They professed themselves as pranksters, wreaking mischief all over England. <laughs> Yes. According, I know, right? <laughs> According to Bauer and Charlie, they did their work from the years 1978 to 1991 when they did the video. Inspired by the Australian crop circle from 1966, which is why I mentioned it before. Okay, okay. Now, this did two things. One, crop circles became debunked in the eyes of the public, lots of ufologists, scientists, etc. And two, it created copycats galore. People took to their neighbors' fields like it was their mission, <laughs> which is why crop circles exploded to a large degree after 1991, hitting over a thousand. Wow! More intricate and artistic designs took over landscapes for everyone to enjoy. Like, for example, in 2017, someone made a crop circle design of King Jong Un in Italy. For fuck's sake! <laughs> that, that's true. You can see the video. Wow! Okay. Yeah. yeah. Here's the last reason, and the reason we're all here. Aliens, or at least the paranormal, right? Finding proof is elusive as hell, as usual. Many believers think that crop circles are simple guiding posts for the weary alien traveler. Mile markers for Earth. This can help understand why several crop circle patterns are nearby populated areas, or more interestingly, landmarks like Stonehenge. A variation 
to the mapping theory for extraterrestrials is that the crop circles are science, kind of like the movie Science, kind of like a hobo code. You know what the hobo code is? Um, I'm called you, Luke. Jay? <laughs> yes, I do. Yes. Okay. Um, kind of like the hobo code where spacecrafts can quickly navigate through and understand potential perils of certain areas or worthwhile but different resources. Wow. Yeah. Everyone look up the hobo code on, on Google. It's hilarious. Another belief is that the crop circles are created by alien spaceship spaceships landing on those fields. Like that's the that's the that's the thing it creates when it lands. Right. Creating the patterns, right? Not unlike parking a car like on a grassy field or something. You know, it creates a pattern. Right. Yeah. Especially if it rains while your car is parked, you see you know, you see that. A field and a parking space are not so different, you know. Kind of makes you wonder what was important about South South England during the 60s and 70s that they would park their fucking cars everywhere, right? (laughs) Lastly, there is a theory concerning portals. The energy used to travel either to a certain time or place or dimension marks the ground into crop circles. Aliens or whatever could be using their designated insignia to travel, hence the different patterns. But can also explain why some are the same as well as the glowing lights. Kind of explains mo- a lot of the stuff, if you think of it in those terms. This theory, or any theory about crop circles connecting to aliens, could explain why England is a popular landmass and other European areas as well. It's because of how long fields are used for farming. Think about it. Most of these English fields have been fields for hundreds of years, steadily, uninterrupted. That and the mystery of Stonehenge could be, could be why those areas are reliable to use if they are portals, parking spaces, or whatever. And that's like a theory I gave at the end there as to why South of England is so popular. I think that's, that's an amazing explanation. Yeah. I love that. I was that's, always from the belief that it was uh, marks left by craft, like they were landing, like you said, parking there. Right. I had no idea about all these other theories. This is, well, this is really interesting. The last two I kind of made up, but yeah. <clears throat> Still, good, bravo. Very thought-provoking. Yeah, and that's, that's what I got on crop circles. So, um, you know, I was, I was funny. I was going to ask you what you would think about crop circles, and you already told me the answer. But um, how long have you known about them? Oh, man, for forever. Forever. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember seeing, you know, I've got television shows in the 80s, you know, Unsolved Mysteries, for example. Uh, talking mm. about crop circles now is always intrigued. Um, yeah, but I love it. And and we actually visited. Uh, you were there, Oscar. We visited a site. The crop circle was gone by this point, mm-hmm. but if you remember back in um, the Serpent Mound episode, we did. Yes, episode From the Ohio 80, thing. Yes, episode eighty-five. That was the uh, August twenty-fourth, two thousand and three crop circle, right next to. You know, we're just talking 100, meet, 100 yards or so uh, from Serpent Mound. And that was the crop circle. That was the double Basica Pisces emblem insignia. Wow. You're really good with remembering these names. <laughs> yeah. So good at that. And, and not only was it geometrically complex, mm-hmm. but it had mathematical significance. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I believe uh, uh, it tied into sacred geometry, the whole thing. But we were there. Yeah. We were there. Um, just a few years ago, but this crop this crop circle appeared there in 2003, right in Ohio, Peebles, Ohio. Amazing, yeah. amazing stuff. And there's pictures. I'll leave a uh, I'll leave a picture in the show notes of that Peebles, Ohio Serpent Mound crop circle. So yeah, okay. I love it. I love it. Nice, nice. Well, that's what I got on crop circles, you know. Um, but I do have another piece here. Uh, should I get into that now, or is there like a segue that I should know about? <laughs> no, no segue. <laughs> Not to break the fourth wall for our listeners here. Right. Um, all right. Uh, you also told me that, uh, well, you, gave, you told me the, in the, in the outline to research a, a person. And I got a person for you guys, uh, a person's life story in a way. And I'm going to get into it right now. That person, this is a story of Bob Lazar. Oh, or such. Robert Lazar. <laughs> 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 Sorry. No, what an, it, okay, I can't wait yeah. for this. All right. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. So the story of Bob Lazar is strange, and it challenges people's beliefs. His story grazes many conspiracies, and several of those began with him. More importantly, Bob's story blurs the lines between truth and lies. Let's start. Keep that in mind, guys. 
Robert Scott Lazar, or Bob, was born in Cor... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, fuck, fucking palindrome names. Um, Bob. Was born in uh, Coral Gables, Florida, in January 26, 1959. Bob attended Pierce Junior College in Los Angeles. He then earned a master's degree in physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, and a master's degree in electronic technology from the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech. MIT and Caltech, two of the most prominent they, institutions in the they, world. They're so smart, they, they wouldn't even let me park their cars, okay? <laughs> that's how smart they are. <laughs> you and me both, my friend. <laughs> you know? That's the way I look at really over or like over dramatically smart places. Um, this guy's been all over. By the way, before I continue on, uh, I got to say, this guy has lived all over. I'm going to give you the states. So I know I mentioned he was born in Florida. Florida, New York, California. I already mentioned those places. You think of uh, Massachusetts, right, as well. You think of um, he's going to you're going to see stories of him in Nevada, New Mexico, Michigan. This guy's been all over the country. It's wow. like not a corner he hasn't been to. I just noticed that now, by the way. So that's not in the notes. I'm just saying it. Yeah. <clears throat> Bob has been employed by several different companies and organizations. This includes working at Nellis Air Force Base, which is an installation located in southern Nevada that was built in 1941 and has military schools and hosts air combat, air combat exercises. Other employment had Bob working as a physicist at the Los Alamos Mason Physics Facility in the early 1980s. That place is located in New Mexico and has one of the world's powerful linear accelerator. He's also been a self-proclaimed film processor, which is something I'm personally, me, Oscar, familiar with. It involves a chemical used to treat photographic paper after exposure to produce a negative or positive image is the old-fashioned way of making pictures of photography. Right now, or lately, I should say, Bob Lazar owns a company called United Nuclear Scientific Equipment and Supplies, although the name of it kind of changed to just United Nuclear or something like that. This company is a mail-ordered outfit that serves amateur scientists, students, teachers, and law enforcement professionals. He sells a lot of geeky science material, which includes chemicals, and actually sold infrared flashlights to the Department of Homeland Security and one time, this is funny, sold 10 super strong neodymium magnets to Mythbusters. Oh, wow. Yeah. How interesting. Did. Yeah, that was a true thing. I saw it in an article. Many people who've known Bob Lazar or worked with him know him to be a well-spoken man, intelligent, and very handy with scientific technology. Bob Lazar had a long time, had long, were, had, two longtime friends named Jim Tagliani and Gene Huff. I like Tagliani. Tagliani, yeah. I'm going to take you, his I, side no matter what. I knew you were going to say something. I knew it. Just, can't resist. <laughs> what was his first it? name? Did you say Jim? Yeah, Jimbo. Um, yeah, J- J- Jimmy Tags, we call him <laughs> on the streets. <laughs> I love this guy. Right on the side. <laughs> I didn't go about him. <laughs> so Jim Tagliani is a serial murderer. No, he's not. I don't know anything about him. All right. <clears throat> Both, sorry, both had lots of interest and fami- familiarity with pyrotechnics. So, in 1987, they unofficially began a festival that still runs every year, you know, up to today, called the Desert Blast Festival. The title should tell you all you need to know. <laughs> really, a Wired magazine article titled "Kaboom" with two <laughs> fucking explanations. <laughs> Why are you making me laugh? Uh, it starts the piece with the following, quote, the only thing that separates the men from the boys is the amount of dynamite in their toys, unquote. Oh, True my fucking, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each year since 1987, on a secret date and secret location, a group of pyrotechnic wizards stage annual gatherings out in Nevada. According to Lazar, it was his fascination with fireworks at a young age that inspired him to lead a life of science and vent and vents, really, with this festival on explosions. So this is like his venting time of the year that he does. Wow. This is a thing that still happens, apparently. Anyway, that was funny. I wanted to mention that. Reading this information gives the man a certain sense of conviction and importance, I would say. Life, though, wasn't all good for him, for Bob. Robert. Bobby. Um, 
After his stint with the Air Force or the U.S. government in general, Bob became unemployed. And this is where he filed himself as a film processor. He made odd claims while working in Nevada at the Nevada installation at Nellis Air Force Base that some attribute to his very downfall. But I'll get to that point later. In 1990, Lazar was arrested for aiding and abetting a prostitution ring. This was reduced to a felony pandering, which he pleaded guilty. During his plea, Bob only at first admitted that he had helped, quote unquote, modernize the business of a prostitute named Tony Bullock. Now that's Tony with an I, it's a girl, by doing some computer work. The complete felony is that Bob had recruited Bullock and encouraged her to solicit. Hmm. According to police records, I read the whole thing. Well, not the whole thing, but whatever the court thing said. According to police records, Lazar met Bullock as a customer. At one, at what? Sorry, at one meeting, they talked for several hours about UFOs, and Bob told her he had a master's degree from two universities. Bob was ordered to do 150 community service hours to stay and to stay away from brothels and to undergo psychotherapy. Hmm. This was a real thing. I read the transcript myself. Now, let's skip a few years. By the early 2000s, Bob was married. Bob married a woman named Joy White. And they're still married, by the way, as far as I know anyway. In 2006, Lazar and his wife were charged in violating the Federal Hazardous Substances Act for shipping restricted chemicals across state lines. The charges stemmed from a 2003 raid on United Nuclear's business offices where chemical sales records were examined. That 2003 raid was strange and bombastic. Recalling that June morning in 2003, Bob said, quote, if they were expecting to find Osama bin Laden, they brought, en- they brought along enough guys, unquote. Hmm. This raid involved more than two dozen police officers and federal agents, all for a couple's home business not a facility or terrorist training camp, just a home. At his home, agents found all sorts of scientific gadgetry, including Lazar's very own particle accelerator. He had one. What? Like a little one, yeah. Not illegal, just odd, you know, he added. The search was initiated by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, a federal agency best known for instigating recalls of faulty cribs and fire-prone space heaters. They targeted Lazar for the chemicals, specifically sulfur, potassium, petrochloride, and powdered aluminum, all of which can be used to make illegal fireworks. Does this sound kind of familiar? Wow. Sounds like something he would do, really. Absolutely. The CPSC, which I just did the acronym for, suspected that the Czar and Joy White were selling what amounted to kits for making M80s, cherry <laughs> bombs, and other prohibited items. United Nuclear pleaded guilty to three criminal counts of introducing into interstate commerce and aiding and abetting the introduction to interstate commerce banned hazardous substances. In 2007, United Nuclear was fined $7,500 for violating a law prohibiting the state of chemicals, the sale, sorry, the sale of chemicals and components used to make illegal fireworks. Interesting. Yeah. All right, let's, let's carry on here. All of that is just the dessert, guys, and the salad, of course. The potatoes, really, are the things that Bob Lazar claimed while working for the U.S. government out in Nevada. All right. In the late 1980s, Bob Lazar was hired to work on a government installation called S-4, the letter S and number four. Oh, yeah. This installation was located a few miles south of what was to be known as Area 51, which is a subsidiary subsidiary installation to the Nellis Air Force Base, as mentioned earlier. Bob said there were concealed aircraft hangars built into the mountainside, actually, which is interesting because we thought that too. This, yes. Right? Because remember, remember, we've been here. We've been here listening. Yeah, yeah, we were there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this S-4 facility was adjacent to Papoose Lake or Papos Lake. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I believe it's Papoose. Yeah, Papoose. Papoose Lake, and it should be said that Area 51 is at Groom Lake, up a little north. What Bob discloses about what he saw at the S-4 facility on TV in May 1989 is why we're talking about him today. 
It is also why he's shake. He's a shaky, believable figure. And very importantly, it's how Area 51 became so huge in the popular mainstream. That's right. What did he see and what did he do while employed there? Well, he was hired to reverse engineer alien technology that the U.S. government had retrieved. He claimed they had at least nine alien spacecrafts at S-4 and Lazar was tasked to work on one of them that he said they called the sport model. The sport model. Yes. Love that, it. That, might be, that name might be due to the small size of the spacecraft compared with the other eight. I'm not 100% though. He doesn't elaborate. At least I didn't find him elaborating on it. He said that the manufacturing element was metallic sounding and feeling similar to stainless steel. This is the aircraft components. Bob claims that the base contractor, EG&G, had hired him to reverse engineer the alien craft to discover their secrets. He also said that what had powered the craft was a heavy substance he called Element 115 or 115. This Element 115, which the alien propulsion system relied on, was of stable isotope E115, which he said generates gravity, like a gravity wave, that allowed the vehicle to fly and evade visual detection by bending light around it. This element was later synthesized and was added to the periodic table of elements in 2004 by Russian scientists. It was later proven by Swedish scientists at Lund University in 2013. E-115 became, I mean, sorry, E-115 came from Lazar's mouth in the 80s, but was finally proven in some form in 2004. It's amazing. It's amazing. Right. Claims that some of the discoveries and reverse engineering done at S-4 is a direct result to the stealth aircraft we've come to invent on U.S. soil. We've heard this before. In addition to all this, Bob claims that he had read briefing documents that describes human involvement with gray alien creatures reaching as far back as 10,000 years. These gray aliens, according to what he read, were from a planet orbiting the twin binary star system, Zeta Reticuli. There it is. which Which was first mentioned by famous alien abductees Betty and Barney Hill. There's lots of other little stuff Bob talked about since 1989. He described to many people, friends and family included, how the S-4 facility had a peculiar method to allow access to the right people. It was a hand scan that measured the bones in the hand, which are unique to everyone, instead of a badge or like a retinal scan or fingerprints. Years later, this method of security was revealed to be true when it was caught on film when the stealth airplanes were being shown to the public. So I won't call them crazy up until they saw it on video. Oh, God. Okay. Essentially, that's what that means. Yeah everything, yeah. everything Bob Lazar claims he saw and touched and heard has no evidence when he claimed them. He didn't risk bringing the element 115 or ship fragments away from the installation when he was fired or let go or he left or whatever. The way Bob saw it, he sees that withholding crucial information from the public is a crime. Not just, not just what he read about aliens' history with mankind, but the technology especially. He says he's wondered about the feats in tech they would allow to escape the S-4 facility, a controlled, trickle-down effect, but with a huge upper hand against its citizens. This is why he came out. Wow. Lazar confessed to all of this to a famous Nevada TV journalist named George Knapp. Good old George. Yep, yeah, yeah, he keeps popping up, doesn't he? He's just involved with everyone, that fucker. He does, he does. That televised special was the biggest their network had ever seen. Knapp kept Lazar close by and became friendly as they had more conversations about Area 51 and S4. Along with his news special, uh, not new special, news special, that's really hard to differentiate. <laughs> Along with his new special, Bob Lazar's credentials were targeted as people from all over the professional world, scientists, ufologists, etc., began looking into Lazar closely. Here's where the hammer drops. Both MIT and Caltech have no records of Robert Lazar attending <sighs> the universities. Man. Nor the government, really, or at least to the extent that Bob claims he did for them. 
even the Los Alamos Mason Physics Facility has no record of Bob ever working for them. Even the discovery and the proof of element 115, which was you know, named uh, in 2004 as Muscovium, because it was made by Russians, was said that it held no properties that could do what Bob Lazar said it should. So what the fuck is going on? Right. It's safe to assume that many people became skeptics as this set of information was revealed. Bob's stint with the law didn't help either to grow his credibility. I'm talking about the prostitution ring. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. We've heard and known of companies, organizations, and governments using this kind of misdirection, i.e. discrediting people, to lower the conspiracy flames while raising the skepticism ones. Absolutely. There are some contradicting information that has been now since Bob's, tele- Bob's televised airing. For one, people of Bob's youth recall driving him several times to the Celtic Library and campus overall when he said he went there. The handprint security system that no one believed came out to be true. The Los Alamos place, the, the physics center, um, actually had a phone book with each of their employees in it. And guess what? Bob is one of them. Bob's name, his name is on there during the time he said he worked there. Where are the records if he's not lying? Is he lying about some things and not others? I don't know. Last but not least, Netflix released a documentary feature about Bob Lazar titled Bob Lazar, Area 51, and Flying Saucers. Here's a portion of the trailer to get some sense of this documentary. This story is extraordinary, especially if it's true. And it all started in the desert, just north of Las Vegas. A local scientist who's worked at Groom Lake said to be where top secret weapon systems have been tested over the years. He has asked that his identity be shielded. Exactly what's going on up there. What's going on up there could be the most important event in history. Physical contact and proof of, from another, another system, another planet, another intelligence. What would happen to you if the government learned that you were giving us this information? He just wanted to stay alive. Maybe this has been kept from us for a good reason. Sir, how do we know you are who you say you are? I kind of like, I kind of like it, but I kind of like the, 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 the Johnny Cash deep voice narrator, but I also question why they hired him. <laughs> um, I don't know if you saw this. Wasn't, uh, wasn't that um, uh, Mickey, uh, Mickey, Mickey Rourke? Mickey Rourke? Maybe, but it's not a little cashew to me. Like, I think it is. Singing. Like, if he's not singing, that's what he sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's Mickey Rourke. Anyway, um, the film is clearly on Bob's side, and it does show the, the reverend George Knapp several times backing up Lazar's story. He's also the producer, I believe, or one of them. In the documentary, Bob and his wife, Joy White, bring up several points that help understand him a bit better you do get a sense of his ingenuity and also how the government can't seem to let him go. The FBI raids his Michigan home between film crew appointments about a conversation they thought to be private. They literally mentioned that. That's a bit eerie and an indication that the U.S. keeps tabs, keeps tabs on Lazar and others like him, most likely. Absolutely. You know, it kind of, it kind of makes the U.S. shady and also discrediting like you don't believe them, it's just like they don't want us to believe Bob, right? If you consider it that way, at least to some degrees. Either way, the story of Bob Lazar is one where you, as an individual, must make up your own mind about what about 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 him, because whether intentionally or nefariously, Lazar's credibility is shot to hell. No matter what I say. And that's really the end of Bob Lazar's story, because there's so many details I can get into. But really, it's something where you have to make up your mind. It's enough out there where half the people, more than half, have um, disavowed him. Yeah. There, are, there are other regular jobs he had that people, come, that they're, you know, those employers would say that, no, they don't want to talk about Bob Lazar at any given because of his credit. You know? Wow. They, they don't want to mention him at all or confirm anything. But, uh, you know, the, the, the thing with the Los Alamos thing, I, I took this detail out, but he was in their phone book. And also, a lot of people think that 
the reason that they didn't think they hired him is because he was hired by someone that worked at the Mason physics facility and hired him as a contractor. But either way, he was in their phone book. I saw the picture. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's other things, other things I can't explain. He can't explain why his records are not in Caltech and MIT and all that, but or government or anything. But at the same time, some of that stuff is contradicting in itself. Some of that stuff has been proven on his side, some of it not. Well, historically, throughout the UFO story, there's uh, disinformation operatives uh, usually put out there by the U.S. government to feed false claims uh, throughout the, the the field of ufology to yeah. dis- discredit some people, to lend credit yeah. to others, to, uh, you know, shuck and jive uh, away from one issue and point it towards another issue. And yeah. uh, it's it's crazy. So. Yeah, you know, let's, there's another. Um, yeah, he talks about that a little bit in the documentary, you know, but he mentions one thing that I guess I, I could mention, you know, because it's his heartfelt thing about it, is that he doesn't want people asking him. Like, he's not a limelight guy. He doesn't like the public necessarily, but um, that's what he says anyway. Right. Um, yeah. But he says that he doesn't like being asked questions like, did you go to MIT or more like, or ask him details from that point? Like what was the course load from this year? Like, you know, questions to make him prove or disprove. Right. He says he hates questions like that because they should be asking the big picture questions of like, aren't you worried what the government's hiding from you and why they're doing it? You know, like, aren't you worried about, forget the fact that we've known about aliens, but like this technology that could be, that's used against you today in ways you don't understand. Right. And that's what he cares more about. He'd rather answer those questions or talk about that in general. And, you know, and maybe maybe that's an approach that we could take on Bob Lazar that doesn't involve his his history. I mean, for a fact, this guy is science prone. He loves it. You know, he's worked on it for better or worse in places proven in some places, others not so much. But he has all his life. His fucking backyard is full of it. So... You know, I would trust his knowledge in some science stuff. You sure. can go there. You can go from the fact that he might be telling the truth and he's just one man against an organization that he can't win. <laughs> the organization being the U.S. government. Right. right. Crazy. But uh, imagine how frustrating if you're Bob Lazar and all his claims are 100% true. He was at Caltech. He was at MIT. He did do the S4 deal in Los Alamos. How yeah. fucking frustrating would this be? To look and say, oh yeah, here's the records right here. Wait, what do you mean they're not there? Yeah, he goes for he goes to apply to somewhere. He tells them, I work for this, and they uh, no, can't find it. <laughs> yeah, yep. they can't find it. That's what happened in the court when he got uh, for the solicitation thing uh, with the hooker. I mean, he the court couldn't find that he went to these places. They Man. couldn't find it. It was hard to find most of his stuff. Um, they found where he was born, I think, and that's it. No, not much in schooling uh, or the employments. Um, and, you know, it also seems like the U.S. government or I think overall, just they fuck with them. Like there's a scene in the documentary and I don't know how true it is because documentaries, you know, especially biased ones, they can kind of lean in heavily. But uh, there's a secret conversation, not secret, but like they were walking in the forest somewhere in Michigan with the crew. Right. And Bob Lazar and uh, they're talking and he the, the guy wants to ask him a, a big question that might incriminate him if he answers in the affirmative so he asked him should we just get rid of our phones throw them like, turn them off put them over there and start talking and like sure or whatever and it, and it, and it skips on ahead right and then the next day you know the screen comes up it says that the fbi raided his house the very next day the very next day and asked him about you know details of the of the conversation he was having out in the <sighs> forest you know <laughs> Obviously, nothing came about and whatever. There's nothing there. But like they asked him or they said something to make them make Bob think that he they knew about the conversation. They knew. Yeah. Yeah. They, they so, heard it. so, you know, and he's had many raids. The two raids that I mentioned are really the one raid that led to the other arrest because they found proof of them selling firework material. Um, there was just uh, that wasn't even the tip. I mean, that was like the second raid, I believe they had at least out of many others that came after. Yeah. And most of them are fruitless. I just gave you the the real criminal uh, records of the whole. Yeah, 
I remember seeing that documentary when it first came out. It's been a while, but I, I, mm-hmm. I recall seeing the raid happen mm-hmm. unfolding in the documentary. They were recording the raid as the raid was happening, weren't they? Uh-huh. Am I misremembering? Don't remember that. I just saw it today, but I did see it in bits and pieces, so I don't remember. I swear, I swear that they. Record- but I know that a lot of a lot of articles talk about that for yeah. sure. So yeah. I get I did get it from there. I mainly got it from reading. I only saw it less than twenty four hours ago, and I barely remember it. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> such happens. such an interesting man. Um, mm-hmm. You know the fact that they did find his name in an employee phone book. Yeah. The fact that he spoke about element 115 before anyone knew what the hell that thing was Mm -hmm. publicly. Uh, The fact that he knew about this hand scanning technology years before it was released to the public on accident. Right. Yeah. Um, The propulsion system that he talked about during the reverse engineering days. Yeah. And he gets into that too. You know, he talks about the, how they manage to use gravity to their advantage. Like the way they travel is that they don't, you know, the way we travel on anything, cars, walk, whatever, like we need something to push away in order to go up, right. To go a direction. We have to push something out of us. Yeah. Like in this, like fire, gas, right. Something in this case for rockets, right. You think of fire and wind, a gust of wind or whatever to blow upwards. Right. And then break the sound barrier, break the fucking atmosphere and get out. Yeah. Um, the way they do it is completely different. They warp. It's like the way he described it. I'm, I'm almost word for word on this one. He described the bowling ball on a bed. And then let's say you put it in the center or something. And then, you know, you go up like a, a foot away from it. And you press down on the mattress and you see the bowling ball, you know, come towards. Right. Sure. Sure. That's how he described the aliens, how they travel. They bend space to go oh, forward. that's right. That's right. You're right. I do remember. Yeah. Yeah. How, and, how fascinating of an idea. And that the limits to that are almost, I mean, there's very less limits about it because you can go anywhere. And the direction, um, apparently, they go belly down. They go belly first. They don't go like straight like this. They go from the belly forward. Really? Because that's the way their engines were set or something like that. They don't, wow. There's no direction like that. They don't have to go super speed because there's no speed. They just bend gravity to go where they want. Oh, man. Like a falling cascading effect. They're constantly falling in the direction they want to fall. Mm. Mm. It's kind of weird, right? And, and of course, you know, in that Majestic 12 document I, I talked about where I, I mm. named the bullets of the, the, the situation uh, report, from Majestic mm. 12, they were talking about the, we had seven flying craft as of the date of that document, which was what, 1989? And Bob yes. was saying nine craft, I think nine. you said. He said yeah. at least nine, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's right there. <laughs> it's seven, nine. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe we captured a couple more by the yeah. time he released his information. I don't know, but yeah, I mean, we're not. Uh, there's not a huge disparity there between the number that Majestic Twelve talked about and what Bob talked right. about. Right. He also um, talked about how how they had him work there. It's very strange too. If you guys want to know that information, I have that too in my head. I didn't put it in. There's no yeah, yeah. with him. But like the way he, well, the way he got hired was kind of shadowy and weird. But when he got hired and he got you know interviewed for for the job there at uh, Nellis or whatever installation s4 he was asked not questions about you know his qualifications or his past job performance he was asked uh strange questions about his personality about him like what he thought of things and stuff like that which he thought was very strange and definitely strange for an employer to ask um he also said that it was like a very hard place to work in and not hard as in like it's hard to get to or anything like that meaning they often screamed at you. It was very strict guidelines left and right. Everyone was mean and everyone was kind of an asshole. But he said that he was easy, was easy to put up with it because at the end of the day, you get to work on an alien spaceship. So like it was all allowed by everyone, but it was a terrible, toxic work environment. Wow. Sounds like any typical government office uh, from what you hear. Right? A lot. Of, right. Uh, <laughs> it's like the least. DMV. Right. Yeah, yeah. You hear a lot of DMV stuff. Um, there's another thing he mentioned. Oh yeah. That everyone worked on separate things. That yes. I was just the they, com- compartmentalization. Exactly. Of job performance. Right. No one knew what they were working on. You knew about this propulsion engine of this one thing that was Bob Lazar. You didn't know what the other guy worked on. Right. No, no one knew on right. the grand picture. I Only very, one, one person, right? Yeah, very, know. very few knew the grand picture. Everyone else. Like you said, compartmentalized. Right. That keeps the disinformation. Also, make sure that whatever information they might expose, 
they would know who to turn to because only one person had this job that he could know the information for. Good point. Makes sense. It's really easy. Sucks, but it's effective. It's an effective way to stop that kind of thing from going out. Absolutely. But yeah, he said all that. He mentions all that. Yeah, and he put Area 51 on the map. He did. He uh, really did. I, I did not know it was so popular. George Knapp in the, in the special, in the documentary, talks about how special it is and how crazy big it got out. 24 hours later, it's in every every news thing in the world. You know? Yes. And it's yes. crazy. He gets, it gets picked up everywhere. Stories go that Bob Lazar used to take certain people mm. out to E.T. Highway, where we were, Yes. To the black mailbox. Yeah. And that's why the black mailbox is famous because that's where Bob Lazar would go with his group of chosen people on Mm -hmm. certain nights every week and watch UFOs coming and going from that that general Area 51 area. Yeah, probably the hidden hangars that are in the mountainside. Quite possibly. Absolutely. He he talked about how, you know, I mentioned that uh, now this Air Force base was uh, officially a, had a couple schools for military, military schools, but also had air combat exercises and um he said he mentions uh that you know people did actually did, did test drive alien spaceships or space technology when they finally made some sort of reverse engineering feat they would try it out in the skies of nevada <sighs> and that uh very risky of course but they said that uh, i remember i think he said every wednesday when he was there that would happen is that, that what like it was a, wednesday it was like a timed event or something yes yes yeah 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 yeah, just incredible. Mm-hmm. Just incredible. Wait, who's Justin? <laughs> Some dick who owes me money. Um, mm-hmm. what, what's our recording time at? I have no idea. Oh, right. Long. We're doing it different. That's right. Yeah. You can tell oh, it's, it's late. Yeah. I'm asking ridiculous questions. Okay. Um, great research. Just very intriguing, enthralling stuff. I love it. Uh, maybe one day we'll come back and revisit the UFO uh, topic. But for now, yeah. over three episodes, probably over what? Probably well over six hours worth of content. Yeah, more, uh, I feel like yeah, it's more. I think really closer to seven, maybe. Maybe uh, maybe I'm exaggerating. Content. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Uh, we hope we hope you and en- you've enjoyed the extraterrestrial extravaganza podcast series. I know I had a I had a blast putting it together. I learned a lot. Oscar, I hope mm. you enjoyed your research. Yeah, I did. For yeah. this, uh, these three episodes. And I think we've said pretty much all we're, we could say right now. Covered all the big topics. I think so. I think we're good. All it's, the it's, big it's, things. At the very least, it's a good, you know, fresh. It's a good start of this gigantic thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good. Listeners, we hope you enjoyed it. Oscar, if you have nothing else, uh, could you kindly fly us home? Can I do it meanly? Yes. All right, let's get the fuck out. That was great. That was a good flow. It was a good flow today. Yes. Good banter back and forth. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm so excited about the watch party. I'm so excited about it. I'm glad. I'm glad you are. I'm Even so if glad. one person shows up, I'm going right. to be just over the moon. Over the moon. Yeah, right. I'll do, <laughs> I will sit in my backyard <laughs> you would, you, all day. I'm on furlough. Yeah. I don't give a fuck. You'll be like, <laughs> what's that uh, famous Texas battle they call it? Um, I don't know. Fucking Little Bighorn? I don't know. Bulge? Alamo? Alamo. Oh, oh, the Alamo. Yeah, that one. Like, you know, the Alamo and that fucking bitch just start shooting them on and one fucking flies everywhere. Kids step out of line. Wait a minute. I can't say that. No, you can't, but you can certainly think it. All right. <laughs> you ready to come back? Are we back? No, we're not back yet. We're not back yet, no.
a drink cart. Oh, get like a drink cart, have it set yeah. up on a corner that we can roll on back and forth. Love that. So get get a, a you got to get a drink cart that uh, looks like a globe, like for the, you see in the old school. On TV. Like, in, like Bond villains and shit? Yeah, exactly. What the, I mean, maybe I for the that. place we own. Uh, that. that would be nice. Yeah. Oh, the final question. Do you have something interesting to show from your recording space? Uh, yes. Do you? Okay, good. All right, then I think I think we are ready. We can just one more. Do you want to do one more? I, you know I do them throughout the show. I just lower the volume and do it. I know I cheat. I'm sorry. That's okay. All right. All right. Five, four, three, two. Welcome to the 100. Breaking news. <laughs> oh, what? Um, <laughs> what? Are you doing it now? No. <laughs> I just want to mess with you. Oscar's like, I'm going to interrupt you. It'll be cool, okay? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> right off the bat. No, no, I'm sorry. Do it regularly. I'll interrupt you later. Drink a whiskey for that one. I'll interrupt you more. Okay.